Welcome to episode 17 of Talking Prisoner. Today we have another special guest with us. This guest played a popular and key role in Prisoner, starting 29 episodes towards the end of 1981 series and into 1982. Her exit from Prisoner is one of the most talked about exits in the show's entire run. But not only did she work on Prisoner, she also worked on Neighbours, both on screen as Barbara Hill and behind the scenes serving as a storyliner and later script editor and also a script writer. She also starred in Kingswood Country, Lay Me Down in Lilac Fields, Freedom, a country practice in which she got to act alongside her daughter, Emo Ruo, Jenny Kiss Me, The More Things Change, Celia and the Liftoff. She was also a script editor on MDA and a writer on The Sleepover Club and Headland. Her novel, The Hero, was published in 1996. And we are, of course, talking about the very talented Louise Linnae, who played the formidable Sandy Edwards. Welcome to Talking Prisoner. Oh, shucks, guys. Thank you very much. Welcome again. Thank Welcome you. Again. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Nice to be here. Nice to be here. I hope everyone's safe in lockdown or semi-lockdown or whatever they're in and doing okay in this time of COVID. Yeah. Now, we've, we've got lots of questions for you about your time on Prisoner and fan questions that we'll dip into later on. But first, we'd love to hear uh, a little bit about your life growing up prior and prior to um, your appearances in Prisoner. Wow. I'll shoot through that pretty quickly because <laughs> it's a long time ago. But um, I grew up in Melbourne in uh uh, Moody Ponds, Essendon, you might know, just in the inner city, I had one sister and my parents and lots of cats and um, my aunt, who was um, intellectually dis disabled, lived with us. And uh, I just went to a girls' school for 13 years, had no brothers, didn't know a thing about boys. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing, had a, a pretty normal upbringing. I was a girl guide, um, you know just did all those things that people do. And always liked to write, that was my big hobby. I liked to write, I wrote stories. And I um, uh, went to the football up at Windy Hill, quite a lot. <laughs> so does that make you so, a supporter? Yeah. It does make me an Essendon supporter, although I was pretty glad that Melbourne won the grand final just recently for my brother-in-law, who's a big Melbourne supporter. And um, I'm pretty fond of the doggies too. But I do follow the footy. There's nothing nicer than sitting back on a Friday night and watching that game with their yeah. on the telly. Great Melbourne tradition. So that was uh, my next question was, where did you grow up as a child? So we'll uh, shoot over to Ken's. Uh... Oh, yeah, sorry, I'm covered. No, no, that's okay. <laughs> we'll cover some pretty, well covered, um, pretty well covered my next question, which was, what was your childhood like growing up? It was, and it was good. We weren't uh, wealthy. We were just very ordinary, um, you know, Irish Catholic family, I suppose. Um, and uh, I, you know, went up the road to the school every every day. I, I quite liked school. I, I don't look back on it with, you know, people look back and say, "Oh, best days of my life." I don't think I would say that, but I would say it was a, a really good education. And and um, I got to. I got to study things that sort of set me up in life a bit. So I can't complain about it really. And, you know, <clears throat> hanging around on the weekends with kids from the, the block and playing. I like to perform. I was always a bit of a performer, I have to say. Yeah. What did your embarrassing uh, enough? <laughs> <laughs> what did your parents do for work back then? Back in the day? Well, my mum stayed home. She was um she was at home looking after us. That was the, you know, the days of women not working very much at all or being able to. But she was a very clever woman, um, and uh, would I think she would in an in another time would certainly have gone on to uni because she was really clever and a big reader. So I had a lot of books in my house. Yeah. My dad was um, uh, he worked up at the Essendon Airport actually, okay. um, but he was a printer by profession and. Um, printed people's wedding invitations and things like that. We had a, a printing press in our back back shed, which he used for his office. And I remember those, you know, those sounds from childhood, uh, his 
printer was one of those um, manual ones back in the day where you set the type. And I can remember that that katink katink sound being part of my childhood in the background all the time. Katink katink, which was the sound the um, the press made. Printing press, yeah. What um, what about your favourite subjects at school? Ah, uh, well, I, I was a humanities girl. I suppose I I, um, I liked English a lot, and I was good at it. You know, you sometimes. Yeah, you just love certain subjects, and I did. I loved books, loved reading, and um, and was good at humanities, uh, and I was reasonably good at school, I suppose. Yeah, and um, uh, I did, you know, the usual range. Did biology. I wasn't terribly good at math. I was pretty young, actually. I started school really young, about four, and um, and uh, I don't know, but I, I think that was okay. But I think I was a bit of a social dud around about 14 when all the other girls were a year older than me. <laughs> but that's, you know, what doesn't kill us makes us stronger, doesn't it? <laughs> that's true. <laughs> what sort of um, jobs did you have coming out of school? Did you sort of go um, to the workforce? No, I went to uni, um, but I, you know, I worked at, at um, supermarkets, uh, being a supermarket checkout person for a while. I worked at a um, elderly person's home up the road actually during school I worked there just going up and doing the morning teas I like that I did that for several years actually and um and then when I was at uni I had a waitressing job for a while you know the kind of jobs you do I actually think everyone should be a waitress you yeah. know it teaches you to be polite and to let things roll over you and to manage um complaints and all sorts of things it's it's uh it's a good lesson in life, isn't it? Crash course in life. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> when did you um, think about becoming an actress? I think I always did want to be. I always wrote and I used to go in for short story competitions, things like that, and I won a few too when I was a kid. Um, uh, but uh, I, I liked performing. I liked, um, oh, you know, showing off, I suppose, is what you have to call it, really. Um, and when I went to Melbourne Uni, I was doing uh, English and I, I heard about NIDA. I heard about NIDA at school and I thought I'd like to try. I wasn't sure if I'd get in and I uh, did some classes and I auditioned and I was accepted. So I actually did one year at Melbourne Uni and then went to NIDA. So it was a really quick transition. I was very young going to NIDA, I have to say. And just, just for the NIDA is a very um, hard school to get into as well. Isn't yes, it? it is. That's why I didn't expect to get in. I was really, really uh, over the moon that they took me in. Uh, it is a hard school to get into, and sometimes you have to audition several times. And um, and it's a hard uh, uh, place to learn. Uh, but I did learn a lot of stuff there. So I went to NIDA in um, 76. 76 and graduated in 76, 77, 78, 78, end of 78. Yeah. That's right. It was um, a, 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 it was an interesting time at NIDA too. Uh, the year ahead of me uh, was all those really big stars, you know, had Mel Gibson and um, Judy Davis were ahead of me. And my year, um, I'm very unspectacular compared with the people in my year. I, was, I went through with Penny Cook and Katrina Foster, Di Smith, Glenda Lynn Scott, who's also in Prisoner. Fantastic, these are fantastic actors. Linda Cropper, me, uh, all of whom have really done amazing things with their careers. Um, Penny sadly died yeah. two years ago. Yeah. That's a great loss to all of us because um, the people you go through NIDA with are, um, uh, it's only a very small group, you know, and you become very close. And even though I don't see a lot of them, I see a few of them, um, every time I see them on TV, it's like seeing a brother or a sister. It's really a very close link. And the men were Lewis Fitzgerald, Andrew James, I'm reading all this, Robert Giltonen, Robert Grubb, Peter oh, Cousins, wow. Stephen Dorick, John Howard, and Bill McCluskey, all of whom, are, you know, they've got, if you look them up, they've got great careers. Big name. And we're very talented. So it was a it was a it was a really good mix of people. And uh, I think we all got on pretty well and we learned and it was hard work. Night is hard work. And it was um, I came away with a lot of lessons that have stayed with me. Wow. 
You've so done. You, um, so just feedback is. Yeah, you're getting your. It's you, Matt. Is it me? Well, no, when you were. Talking, is it me? Can you hear feedback? Uh, I, was, I was echoing. In, it seems to correct itself now. Sorry. That's, oh, okay. Sorry, I'll sit still. Sometimes. I'm no, no, no. I think it was on my end. <laughs> which was, yeah. <laughs> We're all good, still good. So um, just on NIDA, was it yeah. quite like, because um, we have spoken to a few cast members that have gone through NIDA on Talking Prisoner, was it quite strict in the in the way that, you know, you're having to be there on time and... Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it's a really good lesson and I've tried to carry it on to my students when I've taught that, you know, they used to say, if, you, if you're five minutes late, don't come to class, let's say. But if you miss class, you risk being put out. So... If it taught me nothing, it taught me punctuality. But it taught mm. me a great many other things as well. But punctuality is one of the first ones. And really, I say that to my students, you know, just who come strolling in 20 minutes late sometimes. You know, it, it's not a way to conduct yourself for a work, you know, for a work life, is it? So, you know, it was strict. And you rehearsed and you did classes. You rehearsed all afternoon. You did classes in the morning. And at night, you're often performing. So... We didn't have much of a social life beyond NIDA, um, like you do at uni. You know, you we kind of lived in, we often shared houses together, we rehearsed, we did classes and we performed together. And on the weekend, sometimes we'd hang out together. <laughs> Three years of pretty intensive living, I think. Mm. But a good, you know, an amazing kind of place to have been. I feel really honoured to have been there. Definitely. <laughs> Now you've worked both both in front of the camera as well as behind. Do you have a preference? Uh, if I say behind, I, I, it's not because I didn't like being in front of the camera. When I was young, I think it was the best thing in the world and really exciting. And you know, I had some great opportunities. Uh, but uh, working as a writer is probably the thing I came to love more. I liked that, that ability to create narratives and to create stories and to create links and, and to build characters. I really like that too. So but both of them have been fantastic. But I've probably written longer than I was professionally acting when I think about it now. Yeah. Speaking of writing, you released a book in 1996 called The Hero, A Story of Family and Belonging. Can you um, tell us what that book's about and what motivated you? Oh, I think it's a long time ago. I have <laughs> just yeah. happened to have a copy right here. <laughs> wow. It's um, out of print now, so <laughs> you find it in a second-hand shop. Uh, it's about um, uh, a set in the last year of the First World War. Uh, I had lots and lots of great aunts and uncles who were connected to the First World War. My own grandfather was killed in the trenches in France. Um, and, uh, and so I, I've always felt a bit connected to that time. And I, I set it in, in a place called Hillsville in Melbourne, which is a rural place. It had a lot of history. And I was living there at the time with my uh, family, my, my husband and my two little ch children. And uh, I, I just was a great setting, I thought. You know, getting to know living in the country was fantastic. So I, I talked about a family at home waiting for someone, to, waiting for this amazing family member to come back and um, and realising as the story goes on that he actually isn't coming back because it doesn't even look like he went and they, so they had to face up to the fact that he, he had let them down in lots of ways. So it's about, yeah, it's about family and family interaction. Fantastic. It was good fun writing it. Yeah. You're starting to sound a bit like Darth Vader, Matt. Yeah, I'm not sure why it's... Um... I can't hear that. I can hear Matt really well. Yeah, it stops and then starts. I'm not sure. Um... I haven't heard. I haven't heard any of the Darth Vader stuff though. <laughs> Darth Vader be good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Last one. laughs> I bet you've got one, have you? Actually, <laughs> you I do have one downstairs. Signed. Yeah, you just pop it on. We'll all be fine. <laughs> it seems to be okay now. So yeah. Yeah. Look, uh, in 1981. Now, I, I know some of these people or work with them. You appeared on a very funny show called Kingswood County, uh, Country, which yes. starred Ross Higgins, Judy yeah. Farm, Maggie Dents, oh, and Paul McEwen, who a, was a wonderful guy. 
uh, and many other well-known actors. What was it like appearing in episodes of Kingswood Country? Oh, it was it was uh, fantastic. It was a really uh, well-run show. I mean, I know it looks like you know masses of fun and comedy, but comedies are hard to do, aren't they? So it was very strictly <laughs> rehearsed. Uh, I wouldn't say I starred in it. I was just a guest role. Uh, and I um, and then we had live audiences. I've never done, I mean, I've done theatre, but I hadn't done television in front of a live audience. So there were two live audiences, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. We went through our paces, did all the scenes twice. So you had to be on, you, you couldn't make mistakes. You couldn't say, oh, sorry, let's go again, like we could in Prisoner. Um, we just had to get it right, get it right, get it right. And there was a sense that, you know, a real professional sense. It was a really good learning thing for me because there was a sense that this is what you did and you did it right and you didn't make excuses. And if you made it, got it wrong, you had to make it right. And that was a really, um, that was a great experience, actually. Um, Judy Farr, I mean, she was a fantastic actor. Uh, she was wonderful. That all the, the actual cast was quite close, I, I thought. I, I, you know, I sensed that the cast was quite close. Colin was really funny all the time. And um, just, you know, just one of those people that's just naturally jovial and funny. Um, and uh, it was, uh, yeah, what I, what I sensed was a really close cast. And they went on, I think they did quite a few series, didn't they, Ken? You know that, wouldn't you? Yeah. yeah. Um, I had a long conversation with Ross Higgins at one point, and he took me back to the years way, way back that I can remember um, working with people like um, Mo Makaki, um, Hal Lashley, wow. yeah. you know, and, and Ross was very, um, uh, he said that they, they all brought him along, you know, they, they helped him along, they let him have the laughs, they, they were very um, supportive for, for him, and he was such a young man at the time. Um, he, he did make the exception with, with Jack Davey, who he said was a bit inclined to want to keep the laughs for himself, maybe. <laughs> but, yeah, but, well. But apart from that, and the, the likes of George Wallace, George Wallace Jr., um, you know, so he'd had, uh, I was just amazed that he'd had such a, a background yes. steep in, in vaudeville and early radio and so Yeah, forth. yeah, that's and really impressive self self deprecating sort of guy i mean he, he just a nice bloke he was nothing like ted bullpit i can i can certainly <laughs> back you up on that nothing like ted bullpit i don't know how that show stands up to um the test of time i haven't seen it recently you know there are lots of shows we look back at and think oh, was that really our culture i don't know i did watch <laughs> it a few years ago it was it, it was still quite funny it was still yeah. Lex Marinos was in it, wasn't he? Playing the brother in law. He was terrific, yeah. yeah. Bruno. And, and Bruno, that's right. And his wife, who was the loveliest girl. Greta. Um, yeah. That's right, Greta. And uh, Greta, they called her Greta. Greta. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. And um, uh, yeah, I remember I was reading, you know, because, you know, when you weren't needed, you had to sit quietly because things were going on around you. And it was a, it was a very strictly run place. Uh, I took my book along. I was reading Iris Murdoch, but I remember she got into it too. She was she was borrowing my book when I was on set, and uh, so we were sharing a book together. I really liked, you know, really she was really nice. Fantastic. Um, 1985, you played Barbara Hill in Neighbours when it was on Channel Seven, not Channel Ten. Yes, yeah. Last three episode months. 130, you were there until a, uh, episode 167, and then Channel Seven axed it at 100 episode 170. So how did you get the uh, the part of Barbara? Uh, look, my agent rang up and said, you want to do this? <laughs> um, and I think I probably went for an audition and they gave it to me. So it wasn't it wasn't hard, it, you know, it was just what happened in those days. And I was living in Melbourne at the time in Hillsborough. So it was easy to um, uh, to do that. But it was, what I remember about that is we were shooting over winter and I was living in Hillsborough. So that's an hour and a half drive to get to, a, a location on the other side of Melbourne, uh, leaving at four o'clock in the morning for a six o'clock call, makeup call. It was the life, the glamorous life of an actor. <laughs> I remember driving through almost snow to get there, getting into the caravan to get my makeup and shaking, taking ages to warm up. Oh. 
but uh, it was, you know, it was good. I was, I enjoyed it. It was, but when the news came through that the play, it had been axed, uh, I, the cast was really disappointed. You know, I was just a, I was only in it for three months. So I, I didn't have as much invested so, so I could stand back, but they were really disappointed. And I was too, because I thought that it was one of those soaps that could go, I thought to myself, oh, that could go. Um, famous last words because it has um, and it was it was nice that it was bought bought up and and given another lease of life wasn't it yeah, totally and it certainly started a lot of famous actors off and as you know it's gone down in history you know it had very good casting to understand you were correct yeah 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 that's right of course I was correct yeah um it's doing it again, Ken, on you as well. The Yes, I, I know I'm starting to sound a bit like Darth Vader too. And I'm uh, not hearing any of it, so maybe it's all my fault. No, no. You both sound really normal to me. No, it stops and starts. It's really strange. I've never heard it before. It's um, oh. it's like I'll talk and then I will hear it in your room. And the same with Ken, but now it's not doing it. My um, room might be a bit echoey. It's not, you know, it's not set up for... Yeah, no, that's okay. Come on, Louise. We now know that you are actually Darth Vader and you're a ventriloquist. Oh, I wish I was. I love the Star Wars movies. Um, in, in, I, I worked at Channel 7. So when you were working on Neighbours, was, was the studio still at uh, South Melbourne or had they yes, moved? Yes, yeah. No, no, we were in South Melbourne, definitely. So you um, were in Studio 1? Yes. Yes. That's right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely I, I, in South Melbourne then. Um, I'm just trying to think where else we were. A lot of my stuff was, um, you know, we're in South Melbourne for all the, uh, yeah. And and we did a lot of, I, I, for some reason, I don't know why, because of the character, the, the, my character was, was actually a bit silly. It was a bit of an aberration. Um, uh, I was trying to kidnap the yeah. main, <laughs> main character, which is sort of not really a neighbours storyline. Um, but uh, so I was on location a lot. You know, I was doing the you know six o'clock call in the caravan, you know, Footscray or something. Did, did it feel comfortable in the last few days of, of working? You know, once you knew that, the, that it wasn't going to be picked up again, did 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 that cause a problem? I think it did with some people. Some people were philosophical, and some people were you know people were doing what actors do. They were looking for their next job. So there was that, you know, what's going on, what's happening, where are we going next have feeling. But, but, you know, it was, and there were some really good actors on that show. It was really nice. Um, but it, it was, Anne Hattie was pretty philosophical, I remember, about it. Um, because she's a seasoned professional, professional, and uh, you know, it was uh, okay. This has happened. Let's move on. Uh, that feeling, but there was a disappointment because a lot of time and effort had been put into it, and it felt like it could go. And it had a really great opening song. I remember thinking, "It's a pity we're losing that. That's a really good song." Yeah, it was. Um, <laughs> and it, you know, it certainly stood the test of time. It's been reinvented a few times by other groups, but really, the original is terrific. I'm sure the person that made the decision to axe it. Uh probably no longer got their job at sea. They regretted it, yeah. But maybe it wouldn't have uh, gone on as well. Uh, I don't know. There was a change. There was a few people who didn't come back into the cast. And there were so there were new people coming, coming in. And then, of course, there was Kylie Minogue. There was all that amazing. And Jason, they all came in at a time and created a star effect. It was yeah. just amazing, wasn't it? And it was loved by England because it was written because it was... Um, I think Sunshiny, there was that, um, well, I didn't know all this at the time. I knew it when, we became, when I became a writer and an editor there that, you know, it was, we were setting out to send them that sunny Australian feel, which is, in Melbourne is not always true. Because, you know, <laughs> we, um, in Prisoner, oh, gosh, it was cold out there. You know, when I was in Prisoner, they were shooting also another show. Do you remember that, Ken? Um, called, was it Holiday Island? Horrible, horrible Iceland. Oh, horrible. And we called it Horrible Iceland because it was it was icy outside. It was so cold. It was the middle of winter. And these poor, a lot of them were girls, 
um, had bit parts and they were in bikinis all day long. <laughs> and they were, and they come into the prisoner green room, which we had heaters on, and we had jumpers on quite sensibly, and we had our prison uniforms on. It was all very, and I had tights, I used woolen tights. And these little girls would come in shaking like <laughs> leaves. And when they had to speak, they had to give the actors ice to suck mm. in order to, um, so they wouldn't be, you know, breathing out yes. vapor, act visible vapor. So they had to not only insult to injury, not only were they freezing, they had to suck ice. To, um, to, so they, <laughs> that was terrible. So that is the reality of um, shooting in Melbourne in winter. Trying to make it it wasn't really quite the sunny place we were promoting, but <laughs> it's all pretend, isn't it? <laughs> That's true. Ken's got memories of that show. <laughs> um, yes. The, the um, why, why would you choose Melbourne to make a program set in a tropical paradise? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I guess because we, I think they, we had infrastructure. And that was the thing. But of course, you know that um, all this infrastructure they built for Holiday Island became the set of Lassiter's. The set, yeah, would be Lassiter's. Uh, you know, we used to set a lot of neighbours in Lassiter's, and that was because it was the old Holiday Island set and was there. And if it's there, why not use it? And it was very sensible. Um, Nineteen ninety-six, you became a writer for Neighbours, and also had an episode shortlisted for a AFI award which was the episode yeah. about Dr. Carl's horrible affair. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was a big scandal back then. How did uh, how'd you get the job as a writer on Neighbours? Oh, I wrote to them. I said, I actually just finished writing. I had the novel published and I wrote and said, look, you know, I, I'm in the industry, but I really want to have a go. And they, at the time, they had a lot of very young writers and storyliners. And they looked at my CV, which said I was a mum, and I had young teenagers at the time, and they said, get her in, we need her, we need that kind of, and I think that was why. So I, I came in, I wrote for them, and I uh, edited uh, a storyline for a long time, which taught me a great deal about um, creating story, and uh, I wrote, uh, and then I became an editor. But the um, uh, episodes you're talking about, Carl's Affair, First of all, I would say writing for Carl and Susan on Neighbours is one of the great pleasures of my life. They got, they were terrific together. They were actually magical together as a married couple, I thought, really did such a good job. And um, it, no matter what I wrote, sometimes if we ran short, they'd ring up and say, just put in a filler scene about nothing. And I'd write a filler scene just to pop in for two minutes or one minute. And I'd try, if they were available, I would make it for them because they could take a scene and it would be delightful, just domestic life with Carl and Susan was what it was. They were great. So the affair was really good too. Sorry, I just banged my desk. Um, the affair thing was really good. We worked on that story for a long time and I got to write well, quite a few of those episodes, but the one just after it became, um, you just put your hand up fire. Um, no, no, it's, it's just me stretching. Oh, the, the fingers. <laughs> oh, that's okay. And it was um, a real pleasure to write because I knew they'd do it really well. Yeah. Uh, it was exciting to write it because, and I tried to make it real um, about the way everyone wants to know what's going on, but you really want to be private at terrible times like that in your life. You want to be private. You just want to keep it to yourself. So I spent a lot of the time in that episode saying, I don't, I don't want to talk about it, which I thought was truthful. Yeah. And um, seeing their personal suffering. I mean, TV is not, not truthful about people's real emotions, but it can be... It can be close sometimes, and I really tried. And and it was really flattering that the AFI, which I don't think took neighbours terribly seriously, um, uh, as a you know a real purveyor of good quality uh, TV, did in fact yeah nominate it for an award. So I was really pleased. Wow. It was really nice. And there was a couple of other writers too. Can I just add that that also were nominated in that whole sequence because it was a really well thought out sequence, I think. Our producer was Judith Cahoon and uh, she was, you know, she has a lot of cred as a TV writer going right back to Bellbird and, um, 
and she knew how to put that story together and I thought she did a great job. It was a big story back then. <laughs> it was. It's not the Carl affair. Just going back just a second, but um, with as a storyliner, what where do you draw on? That, that's obviously just coming up with the idea for a story. Where do you draw on ideas for stories? As a story? Well, we talk a lot and we, and everyone talked about their childhood. That's why they say they quite wanted me in because I was a mum and everyone else, there wasn't a parent. They were young things out and about. So they were great for all the young things stuff. And I'd come in and say, well, what about, you know, <laughs> what would their mother think if they were doing it? So, uh, yeah, I was able to bring a bit of um, mum, mum uh, logic. I don't know I was that good a mother, but I, but I was able to bring the theory of good mothering. Um, and my kids helped. You know, I'd say, oh, what, what would happen? What would happen if we did this? And they'd give me some ideas. And, um, and, and that, that helped a lot, really. Uh, but what we do, it isn't just coming up with stories. You have to write them up. You have to put them in sequence. You have to... Um, uh, I used to teach this at uni afterwards. I used to teach writing, t TV writing. Oh, okay. And you have to... Uh, uh, get three different storylines and then push them in together and wind them in together for each ep and then you'd write that up and that would go out to the writers. So you'd write it up and the writers would then take it and put the words to it. So it was actually quite a complex um, job storylining and uh, really good good teaching job for, you know, to learn the ropes, I think. Just fantastic. I had a lot of fun storylining. Storylining is still a job. Yeah. I, don't, I don't see it a lot on the end of credits of shows, the storyline, or is it still... Uh... It's always done in some form or other. Yeah. Writers aren't... Uh, even if a writer's writing for a show, they'll often come in and um, they'll have a, a round table meeting. So you won't call that storylines, but you'll have two or three or four people with them and they just sit there and they map out what the, what yep. the episode's got to contain. So writer, writer never writes blind. They have to write to continuity. They have to write to all sorts of things. So you've got to have people around you. So those people are really performing the role of storyliner, even if they're not given the title of it. Oh, uh, okay. But Neighbours always had storyliners. It, it just made it a smoother transition and it kept the continuity really much better. Yep. Did you ever have storylines that, that didn't make it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we did. Sometimes they just... Uh, uh, with the, if they didn't work, we'd put an end to them pretty quickly, you'd know, at an early stage. But we had a couple of real crises on um, Neighbours. We had one young uh, actor who got glandular fever and had to be whooped out really quickly. Uh, and then uh, we had to just simply insert another storyline that didn't involve that actor. You know, that, that, that meant staying there for days and days on end and weekends trying, and then you have to fit it in to where the actor's scenes had been. And um, then Anne Hattie got sick. Um, uh, I think I, I was on that. I just wrote to try and get her out of the show because she wasn't well and she couldn't keep, she couldn't keep doing it. And that was a kind of a sudden thing. So, um, but that was all right, that, that kind of thing. So there is a lot of, storylines do a lot of work in the background. Um, speaking of Anne Hattie, who was just, an amazing actress. She played Helen Daniels for 1,162 episodes. And you wrote a lot of the scenes surrounding her death on Neighbours. Um, now, Anne Hattie also played Alice Hemmings on Prisoner for five episodes in 1979. Yeah. Um, that, that scene with Helen dying in that last episode was, was a really emotional scene. Um, what was it like working with Anne and writing those scenes? Well, because I was a writer, I didn't, I mean, I knew Anne um, from being in Neighbours, but I, I didn't work with her as a writer. I was writing in the background and would go back out to the writers. But I knew her and I knew what she, you know, she was terrific and just a real trooper, just, true, just a trooper. And she wasn't well, but she was going to do it. She was going to do it no matter what. So I was really... You know, you knew you were dealing with somebody who could uh, manage things. And I, I was put onto it just in a separate room just to write a sequence that was going to be able to be slotted in so that we could we could shoot this. And we had to shoot it reasonably quickly because she, you know, she, she wasn't really up to it. She had to have lots of rests. Um, uh, but she was terrific. Um, and I just wrote and wrote and wrote and people read it and said yes or no or change that and I, I did that. And... Um, yeah, I did write that last scene too with um, sitting around with the family. Yeah. Wow. It was, it was, 
it was it was I, but I knew she'd do it well that was the thing I mean you know you write something but an actor brings it to life and that's the thing that's um you know you can really rely on it people like that yeah she, um, she and I used to swap books from time to time um we're both very big readers and um she'd come into the, the studio and, and say oh here's a book that you might like and you know I did the same thing so um we had a good rapport yeah she was a good person nice and a big funeral out at Lassiter's that do you know, I mean, it was a memorial service after oh. she died which is some time late and they had it out there at um, the neighbours set well, that's amazing she was also yeah, married to nice. um, James Gordon who played yeah. Mr. Dwyer on Neighbours, head of, um, not Neighbours Prisoner, the head of the department. James. James Dwyer, James. I think his name was on Prisoner. Um, oh, right. Yeah. Yeah, terrific. Yeah, lovely actor. Really lovely actor. Both of them. You, want, you worked with Reg Watson, who created Prisoner on Neighbours. What was it like working with Reg? A lot to do with Reg. I'd like to say I did, but I don't, I don't think I did. Um, he came in occasionally and, uh, you know, what a really good guy. And he, uh, yeah, he'd worked really hard at creating that, um, uh, the whole Neighbours thing. Um, and I saw him only, uh, I only saw a little bit of him on Prisoner, I have to say. So I, I can't, he's just one of, one of those, one of the people you, you mix with, but I didn't have a great deal to do with him. So there's not much I can say about about that, elaborate much. That's okay. Um, would you ever like to write for Neighbours again? Or would you write again? I think it's moved on. I, I think you have to be, you know, I think it's moved on and um, uh, and I haven't seen it recently, um, but uh, uh, it's, writing television is, is hard work, great fun, hard work. Um, but, and it was a great uh, learning time for me but I know I know I'd probably move on to something else now yeah you also um you, you've you featured on uh behind the scenes look at um neighbors about 20 years ago yeah. <clears throat> about 20 years ago called neighbors reveal where you had talked about viewers phoning in wanting to book into the Lassiter's hotel believing it was real yeah, and people would get presents when they're having a baby and stuff like that. It was really nice to think, you know, at its best, soap is about uh, talking us through our life, you know, talking us through our own crises and stuff like that. And at its worst, it gives off wrong messages. You don't want that ha happening. So it was really nice that people did that. But we also got, um, I remember I got a phone call from a man who'd been watching it with his children at night. He liked the show very much. And he said, the thing I'm noticing is that sometimes the actors don't pay for their coffee when they go into the coffee <laughs> shop. And he was right. You know, we were riding away, we're worrying about the story. And that simple action of transacting wasn't taking place. And he felt that, that was a wrong message uh, for his kids. And I, I thought it was right. And I made a note of it. And I said to everyone, we really want to make sure when we put that in that that the transaction occurs, that you're handing the money over and getting your coffee and, and things like that because it's part of the real world and it's you forget that young, you know, the people who are mostly watching Neighbours were between 9 and uh, 15 and then a much older demographic. Yep. So, you know, you, you have to be responsible as well, I think. It's really important. So, yeah, things like that. And there was somebody also... <laughs> And this was really innocent. Somebody had a T-shirt, wardrobe had bought this T-shirt, and it had something written in a foreign language, I can't remember what language it was now, across it. And it wasn't awful or dirty, but it was disturbing to the people who could read it. And I got a phone call about that, it came through to me, and I rang the wardrobe department, and they got rid of the T-shirt straight away. It, it wasn't um, obscene or anything like that, but it was not appropriate probably I can't remember the detail of what was written on it but people who love a show they also have an ownership of it and so I really liked that they were able to ring and tell me that stuff and I was able to say oh, we'll do something about it um, as far as possible 
the, the, the uh, stars paying for their coffee in Daphne's coffee shop is because of you. Ah, maybe, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, but it's a good idea. It is a good idea to do all that stuff. Um, now, I know the fans are going to be dying for us to get into Prisoner. We'd like to break down some of your highlight episodes shortly, but before we do, sure. we need to ask you some questions about it. Um, yep. Had you watched Prisoner prior to getting the part of Sandy Edwards? Yeah, when it came on first, uh, I did. It was new and it was exciting and I was, uh, I was probably uh, just through NIDA. And, uh, yeah, I did. I watched those uh, first probably 13 weeks. Um, it was really impressive. It was impressive because it was, you know, monochrome in colour, with grey walls and, and um, people not looking glamorous. And it was kind of, kind of new in lots of ways. We have a lot of glamorous shows, um, but this was different. It was different, and it was using actors, really good actors. It was really using people who'd been, you know, been in the industry for a long time. We had a lot of experience, and it, and it was really nice watching it. So I did, yeah, watch it in the first, certainly the first six months, maybe I watched it. And how did you get the actual part of Sandy Edwards? Um, I was rung up to go to an audition by my agent. And um, I flew down to Melbourne and I was living in Sydney at the time. Um, I flew down to Melbourne and uh, was auditioned. And I met um, one of the producers was, I think at the time, Godfrey Phillip. You know, I remember him. He was, he produced children's television. And, uh, and I'd watched a lot of it when I was a child. He came and they said, oh, this is Godfrey Phillip. And I said, oh, Godfrey Phillip. Oh. <laughs> so excited about meeting the man who produced Adventure Island, I think. It was so exciting, a kid's show, you know. Anyway, uh, and they asked me if I smoked, and I said, this is terrible. I said, oh, yes, I didn't smoke. I mean, sometimes I smoked at parties in those days, only because I thought it made me look mature. That's how silly I was and childish. Um, but I didn't smoke very well at all. And, uh, and they said, because people in prisons tend to smoke. And I said, oh, yeah, yeah, no problem, no problem. <laughs> Terrible. And uh, I went back and I waited and they said, yeah, they wanted me to start. And I, I was very excited. And um, my agent said, do you smoke? And I said, I'm not. Oh, yes, yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I think, and I'd really try it. In the first few episodes, uh, this is terrible to even try to smoke is silly, but in the first few episodes, I did, uh, you know, have a cigarette, do all that. But I always looked a bit dumb smoking. <laughs> a <bit> sort of... <laughs> and I, I'm an asthmatic. Can I just add that? I'm a mild asthmatic. But so, you know, you know, it tends to make me go <coughs> a lot. So um, I think they realised I looked terrible. <laughs> and, um, and, and they stopped, stopped asking me to light up or something like that. Also, can I add that I became pregnant while I was on that show? And that, that whole time I was there, I was pregnant. And the first thing that happened to me was that the smell of anyone's cigarettes had, uh, made me sick. So oh. apart from the fact that I was robustly healthy, the smell of cigarettes wasn't good for me anyway. So I was very quick to stop it. Yeah. <laughs> Smoking, you know the um, yeah, young actresses telling people they can do things they can't. Can I? That's a lesson <laughs> to be learned. Just off topic, there was a lawsuit not long back about um, a gentleman in America was suing Marlboro because he thought by smoking Marlboros he's going to look like the guy on the the horse, you know, the Marlboro, yeah. <laughs> and and he didn't. <laughs> Boy, <Yeah>. old. <laughs> it's historic, really. but I. Oh, watching something recently that had a lot of smoking in it oh i watched a british thing called des just recently which is quite frightening about a serial killer and um david tennant was just a wonderful actor but you know they all smoked all the time and in the crown they all smoke all the time but um it just looks so weird now because you don't yes. see smokers the way you used to you just don't and and that's a blessedly good thing um but yeah that was a that was just me being a young actress full of, uh, you know, bright, bright eyed, <laughs> bushy tailed about everything instead of just telling the truth, which was that I didn't smoke. Now, I'm surprised tobacco companies didn't get sponsorship with prisons back then. <laughs> and they um, have, I don't know. 
Going on to your audition, so did you audition for Sandy? Was that the role? or did Yes, you... it was. It was. And in fact, the first scene that I did was one of the first scenes that I shot. So they must have taken it straight out of the script. It was the scene with um, Meg, with Elspeth Valentine, in the, ha having that in interview when you first get into prison. Yeah. And um, that was the first studio scene I shot. And before that, there was some, some outside scenes, like um, in, the, in the van coming in. Mm. <clears throat> you were um, you were also quite young when you first appeared on Prisoner, <clears throat> round about twenty five ish. Twenty four. I was twenty four. Well, Just turned twenty four. In fact, were you nervous working on such a high rating show like Prisoner? I was really excited about it. Um, uh, I think I, you know. I think I was I was in awe of some of the actors who I had admired myself when I was uh, growing up, in, when I'd seen them on TV, people like Elspeth, Gerda Nicholson, I'd watched on TV um, in other things. And it was really, you know, really in awe of them. Um, and so that was, that was terrific. That was, a, that was a really special thing. And they, of course, turned out to be such nice people, such wonderful people. Um, yes, I was a little bit scared. I wanted to do it right and make it and make a good impression. And uh, I remember that first scene with Elspeth. I because I rehearsed it and a lot, had done it for the audition, I knew it really well. And when we filmed it, we did it in one take, just shot it through. And she applauded me at the end. She said, Well done. And she gave me a clap. And that was um what well, says a lot about her, doesn't it? About kindness and support and the kind of things. And I I probably didn't even think at the time to thank her for it, but it was a very kind act of welcoming me into a cast, which I'm very grateful for. Yeah. Did you, um, when you got the part of Sandy, was it, did you know it was just going to be the 29 episodes at the time? No, no, I didn't know. Really, if, I think it was just an open um, contract. Uh, and, you know, it had the option of going on, I suppose. Yes, yeah, so so um, I, I was just there, but I was living, as I say, I was living in Sydney, so I had to fly down and live in Melbourne to do this, oh. um, which created a few problems uh, for me. Uh, but that was all right. I came from Melbourne. I was staying with my mum, staying with my sister. It was nice to to be around the family again. Yeah, you're at the centre of uh, a lot of big episodes. Did you ever feel any pressure with the role? Oh, sure. You know, yeah, you know, learning lines the night before and going in and rehearsing them and then shooting them. There's, um, there was always a pressure on. You didn't sort of sit back laughing and, well, we did laugh a little bit in the green room, but, you know, you know, you were expected to turn up and do the job. And those early starts, you know, were really tough. I mean, I'd get there and get my makeup on and curl up on a couch for a while until they called me. Um, you had to be there. You had to be on on message the whole time and, and, and thinking about your character. And also the other thing you have to think about is continuity because you shoot things out of sequence. So that if it was a big ticket scene, I had to know that when I shot the scene the week before, I had to hit the right point that I could then carry it through to the scene I was shooting this week. Uh, and that happened a few times. That was a, it was a good learning thing for me. Remember, I was a really young actor. At NIDA, we did a lot of theatre. We didn't do a lot of television at all in those days. I think they do a lot more of it now. Um, so, I, you know, it was all part of a learning curve for me. It was uh, it was pretty exciting. Yeah. And lots of support. People were really nice to you. There was a, uh, you know, the green room was a nice place. It was a nice place where we sat and felt relaxed and people, there were people there who were funny and people there who were who were um, serious and, and, you know, a real cross-section of, people but they were all professionals they were terrific people like Maggie Miller you know who's a RADA graduate um you know absolute professional um Judith McGrath who always made you smile she was very funny um Elspeth who was always supportive people like that were wonderful Olivia um Kate Shiel and Wayne they were, they were wonderful people and plus all the other people around who were in and out of the prison scene so it was a nice family just when you were talking about the cast that you're working with, 
Um, do you have any memories about Judith McGrath, who played Officer Powell, that you could share with us? Oh, yeah, and Judith went on to lots of other shows too. Yeah. Uh, she's just, she was just great value. She was a, a very funny person. You know, Officer Powell was so severe, but Judith was very, very funny, warm, dry, witty yeah. person. A really nice spending time with her. You remember her, Ken? Um, yes. She was just nice to sit quietly within the green room and she'd be reading and I'd be reading. And she always had something funny to say, though. She was really funny. There's lots of antics in the green room that would take people by surprise. I suppose people knew that Betty, Betty and Colette sang so beautifully in the green room. Suddenly they'd just break into song and they'd have harmonies and they were, oh, they had beautiful voices, so talented. And they'd sing, and they sang a whole range of songs. One of them was that they used to sing songs from Sesame Street, which were just so funny and so cute and so, well, just wonderful, really. It was, I, I remember that really well. They were terrific. Oh, fantastic. Um, did you ever make any storyline suggestions for Sandy? No, I didn't know you could. I was, <laughs> you, to, you guys have to remember. <laughs> I'm 64 now, I know about this stuff now. When I was 24, I didn't, and I didn't know I could. So I just said, thank you very much for my script, and I'd sit and I'd learn it and I'd do it. But, you know, if I, if I had the understanding or the experience about me, yeah, you can do it. And I noticed, you know, when I worked later as a writer, that sometimes actors did come in, and sometimes the stories they suggested were not going to work for us, but so, a couple of times they were, they did work. On Neighbours, I remember um, the fellow who played Lance, terrific actor, uh, Andrew Bibby, he yep. suggested that uh, that uh, Lance could develop a uh, gambling habit. And that was his idea. And he brought it to us. And we said, yeah, we can do this. And, um, and it gave us, well, quite a few weeks of um, story ideas. So it certainly can be done, yeah. What do writers <laughs> see cast members coming up with ideas? Uh, mostly uh, that you have to get past a kind of a prejudice, a kind of a scathing prejudice. They think, oh, I'm sure they don't know what they're talking about. But often they do, and that's good. Uh, it's it just that I often have to think about their own character. But when you're thinking about a story, you have to think about how that impacts other characters and whether it's going to in, uh, allow other characters to have stories uh, coming off the one you've suggested. So if it's a story that only concerns one character, it's not going to go anywhere. But if it's a story that can draw in effects uh, and, or extrapolate other characters, then it's really useful to us. And we spend a lot of time thinking about that ourselves. Right? Do you know um, who, who actually created the character of Sandy Edwards? I don't. Uh, do you know, Ken? No. I, I thought perhaps Ray Colley might have had something to do with it, uh, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I know that uh, writers, some writers tended to um, utilise, uh, for instance, with um, uh, Officer, Officer Powell, her dry sense of humour. I think Coral Druin tended to utilise that dry sense of humour and write lines that would suit her, her personality. Yeah. yeah, and she did have a really dry delivery. It was more in evidence in subsequent shows she did, you know, um, the hospital show she did uh, and something else. I see her occasionally on the TV and I think, oh, that's pure Judith. Yeah. 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 yeah, she had a big part on um, All Saints. All Saints, sorry. Yeah. I had a little yeah. blank in there. It's All Saints. Thank you very much, Matt. Yeah. Um, for a period, you be Sandy Edwards became top dog, which was a pretty big thing in prison. Yeah. Uh, while B was yeah. <laughs> how did you feel about being top dog? For that? It was very exciting and, and a real honour. I didn't realise that was going to happen. As I say, I didn't know until I got the script myself. I didn't really know what was happening. Um, uh, and, but it was great. And it was, it was useful because Val had been seconded to make a movie somewhere so she needed time off that was the the wow. thing and they needed someone to step into uh, a top dog role and I was there and they decided that it would work for my character who was apparently very tough the murderer with the heart of gold I used to think of <laughs> which is kind of 
a real weird dichotomy. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so Val actually had leave. So I saw her for the first couple of weeks. Then I didn't see her again for a couple of months because she was busy shooting a film. And in that time I was top dog. And then she came back in and there was the wrangling for, for supremacy, you know, and it was there. So it was, it was worked out really well to, to manage that period of time. Uh, and it was, it was good. It was good. I don't know that I'm really in the real person, the real me is not a top dog material, but you know, I tried, I tried to make Sandy a bit of a top dog. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about what it was like working with people like Wayne Jarrett and Olivia Hamnett, both sadly no longer with us, uh, of course, having tragically passed uh, away at the ages of 31 and 58 in 1988 and 2001 respectively. You had some fantastic scenes with both of them. I did. And um, uh, first of all, I'd like to say that uh, I, I really am glad I got to work with both of them. Um, Olivia was beautiful. I mean, she wasn't just beautiful on the outside, which she was. She's very elegant, very beautiful. She was actually very beautiful on the inside too. She was a very, very elegant person, very warm and a nice person to have around in the green room. And nothing like her character, of course. She's just a warm person. She knew a lot about, an, a lot about antiques, I remember. And um, she had uh, dogs and she'd done a lot of work. And I remember her uh, as a child watching her in Rush as the... Um, as the uh, female lead in Rush uh, with John Waters, and she was very beautiful. So working with Olivia was great. She was, you know, quintessential professional. It was, you did the job, you turned up, you did good work, and you didn't make a fuss. And it was, for a young actor, they're the lessons you need to learn, you know. And and it was great. She was just a great person. Wayne, I actually knew from NIDA because he was a year ahead of me. So while you don't always know lots of people who've gone to NIDA, you always know the year ahead of you. And so I, uh, he was in that year. So I, I'd known him and I'd seen him on stage before. Um, and so that was nice that I knew him. Wayne was the most unaffected person I've ever met. He didn't, he wasn't actorish, he wasn't mannered, he wasn't, um, he did his job, he was just, he was like a brother. He was like a good natured. He loved sport. On the weekends, he'd go out on the um, uh, he'd go out windsurfing. He had a windsurf. He was very healthy, very uh, fit and healthy. Terrific, just a terrific person. Really good. Died absurdly young. Just so sad, so sudden. I think um, I do know that his year, the year ahead of me, they had a they had a reunion. Um, before he died, so they all got to see him, which is really nice to think. I didn't know that he died until after it happened. Wow, very sad. Yeah, really sad. And Olivia, I went to Olivia's memorial um, service when she died. I was run up and I went to that, and that was that was really nice to be there and be part of that mm. because she died too young too. Oh, she did. Getting on to the, what are the differences between Prisoner and some of the other shows that you've worked on? Uh, prisoners, prisoners are on its own, really. When you even think about Australian television, prisoners on its own, and it's on its own because it's women. It was women at a time when really women were often supports, or they were the mums, yeah. or they were the you know sometimes they were cheeky and things like that, but they weren't really the spearhead of the show. And in, when prisoner, they were the spearhead. And it was uh, a remarkable show for that, for the time that it was shot in. And, uh, you know, it will always be out on a, a, a run of its own, I think. Um, as I think I said before, it was just amazing to work with those really professional women who'd just done their time in the industry, you know, and they, they knew the stuff and they knew so much more than I did. Um, but they were generous and kind and... A good good group to be with, really. Really, generally, a, a very good group to be with. And, and the stories are about women, and the stories are about women's problems. And you know, I don't know that they were that truthful about a jail. Um, 
I used to think sometimes we were in St Trinians rather than a jail. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you couldn't really put the truth. Uh, prisons are, are terribly tough places and terribly hard. And I, I don't know that they were as truthful as, you know, reality. But then television isn't reality, so... Yeah. It was it was just great, and and they used just used people who were good, not just people who looked fabulous. Um, and they you know they didn't cover over your pimples again. <laughs> they just said no, no, you're right. <laughs> just a little bit of cover, just a bit of covering would be good, I think. But no, uh, they were you know it was it was warts and all people just being people, and I think it's historically uh, really one out of the bag for that reason. And I applaud them. I applaud them and I applaud it for that reason. Did you get a lot of fan mail when you were in prison? Uh, yeah, uh, probably not as much as Val or, you know, people like that and Betty and, and Colette and Lizzie, who, you know, <laughs> Sheila. Um, but, yeah, I did at the time. It was, it was surprising and it was uh, a little overwhelming. I, I didn't. I wasn't ready for that, I think. I didn't really know. As I say, I have to think back, I was pretty young and um, I didn't know that that, that would happen and it was very flattering. And um, there are people who wrote to me and still occasionally write to me, um, especially from Britain, really terrific people over there who just, I mean, they've got a, a real culture of soaps and they're faithful to soaps, aren't they, over there. They've had Coronation Street for how long? and and um, uh, things like that, you know. So they they have a, a real a real love of that ongoing serial kind of show. And I really appreciate that. And the people in Australia still talk about it a lot. But I think Britain's the biggest fan of all. This is really just terrific. And I, I and I'd like to say thank you to all those really terrific people who said so many nice things about me, flattered me far more than I deserved. <laughs> we said so many more nice people. I, I wasn't that good. But they, were, but they were great fans. But I, you know, I really loved Joan Sandy. She was great. Yeah. She was tougher than me. I, I, I kind of would like to be a little bit more like Sandy than I am. <laughs> Are you still surprised that in 2021 how popular the show is? And also, this is normally a fan question, and I'm surprised it wasn't with you. Do you, do you watch uh, Wentworth, the new... Prisoner show. Um, I've only dipped into it a couple of times because I'm not the biggest serial watcher. I, I watch series and I watch movies. I don't watch serials so much, but uh, and it's wonderful. You know, it's a wonderful show. Really terrific. Um, yeah, yeah it's, it's really good. But I haven't. I've got addicted to it or anything. I don't feel that. Um, I think probably if I had one of those ongoing characters, it's now being represented in, in Wentworth, I might be more yeah. likely to, but it's a terrific show, really well done. Yeah. And are you surprised at how big Prisoner still is to this day? Yes, yeah. yes. I did a, I did a oh, I think it might have been 10 years ago, I did a publicity thing. I tend not to, because I live a long way from the city. I'm, I'm a rural person. Uh, but I did one, and I took my daughter along to it, my daughter Victoria, who was the baby I was carrying while I was in prison. Um, and uh, we met, I met, I saw Alice, Elspeth again and a few other people like that. And it was really nice to, to catch up with people. And, and Yenta Sobbett, who played Mouse, I saw her. And um, just that was really nice to catch up. And there were lots and lots of people there still yeah. liking it. And, and it's, it's humbling. It's, it's terrific. It's really, I'm uh, really grateful for for people's um, loyalty, it's that's amazing. Many actors have different techniques for learning lines. Um, how about you? Uh, I don't know the various techniques. I think I just say them to my. We, we get the scripts. You know, you have to learn quickly a lot of stuff, and we get the scripts one week for the next week. So really, you'd be doing it the night before. You might read them all through on the weekend and then you'd be learning them the night before, learning your scenes. Um, which is why sometimes we have to do one or two or three takes because, you know, it'd be easy to forget. 
but there's something about, I don't know, um, probably someone who knows about psychology would know this or biology, there's some part of the brain that you can actually put temporary learning into. Because, you know, if you ask me to say a single line from prisoner now, I wouldn't be able to, oh, I might be able to say one. But um, something about being a slag would be part of it. <laughs> we said that a lot. Whack that, off. Was our, that was our go-to word. <laughs> but, but, you know, you put everything into that, into that um, without even thinking about it, you, you, you commit everything to that temporary part of your brain. And once you've shot it, you, it's gone. And then you do it again. I think most actors would talk about it talk about that a lot of people ask that isn't it funny and I think I don't think even at night we never talked about it it was just something that happened you did it and it moved on it wasn't um something we learned it was something you just did and I think most of us do it without even knowing we do it yeah. can quickly we can quickly remember even a recipe you can quickly remember that you may not remember the next week things like that That's so it's just the usual thing yeah yeah um Episode 235, which I want to talk about, which coincidentally was 40 years to this date last week. It aired on the 6th of October, 1981. Uh, written by Alistair Sharp, directed by Rod Hardy, and the cameramen were Peter Hind, Robin Reed, and Ken Mulholland. So my question, <laughs> Ken, my question was about your first scene in the, uh, the prison van having a smoke, which we've actually... Just spoken about. <laughs> no good old um, so we'll head over to Ken's question. You caught me in. Sorry. <laughs> middle. The middle. <laughs> you indicated in, in, in the reception area and they are trying to induct you, but you tell Officer Conway that you're not Sandy Edwards and your name is Janine Scott in for it in moral earning and for three weeks. Quite a funny scene. Jim mm. Fletcher, who is the governor in this episode, played by Gerard yeah. Wright, who reprimands you for what you did. You had some great scenes with Gerard over the next few episodes. What are your memories of working with Gerard? Um, really nice man. Really enjoyed working with him. Uh, and uh, I met up with him at a, uh, a reunion um, uh, oh, was, which would have been 20 years ago. And um, just... Uh, he was a lovely guy and he wasn't in it all the time. I suppose we remember him because he was one of the few guys, wasn't he? Ongoing guys. Um, so he was important for that reason. Um, it, it was a nice scene. I, I think the writer has to be commended for that, for that particular scene because if you want to remember someone, you have to get them to do something quirky right at the beginning and the writer just said, she's here, she's got an attitude you're going to remember her with that little moment. And it was um, a really nice piece of uh, introductory stuff for, a, for an actor to do. It was good fun. Gerard was actually the first male officer to ever appear on um, Prisoner. Yes. Yeah. 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 Do, we, do we actually and know... One, one, sorry, go on. Sorry, I was going to say, I don't know where Wayne fits into that number, but he was only about the second or third, wasn't he? And then they had the scary one for a long time. Um, who was the scary one? Oh, Jock Stewart. Oh, yeah. Well, that actor, God, he's lovely. He was a lovely actor. Yeah. Nothing scary about him, the gentlest soul. <laughs> Do we actually know what a moral earnings are? Is that is that for... I guess it'd be prostitution. Prostitution, it? yeah. I mean, you yeah, I think so, wouldn't it? Idea. <laughs> Maybe they called it that. Maybe that was the legal term for it. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yes, probably. Yeah. Um, I don't know, but I'm sure it was prostitution, yeah. <laughs> Kate Shield, what was it like working with Kate? Oh, she was great. She was great, yeah, yeah. Another person who who was not like the, the character. She was, oh, the character's quite a nice character, I think. Um, but she was uh, just a, a good person to have around to talk to and, 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 and she's beautiful, fabulous long red hair she had. Gee, she was gorgeous. Yeah. Um, and she knitted me the most, crocheted me the most beautiful baby shawl, I remember. A lot of people, we did a lot. This is terrible. And it's actually um, uh, talking about women. We did a lot of knitting <laughs> in the green room. There was a lot of knitting went on, you know, because you couldn't concentrate too long on anything. So it had to be, you had to do things that you could put down. So people who were talented 
you know, like things like that. They had knitted and crocheted and did things like that or read the paper or did the crosswords. And I tried knitting. I was a terrible knitter. I was about as good a knitter as I am a smoker. Um, but, yeah, Kate, Kate was really, didn't, oh, made the most beautiful baby shawl, which I still have. Can't part with it. I love it. I think Margot Knight said it was a few weeks ago that about the knitting and then you'd have to go and do a scene so they just pass it on to the next person. Yeah. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. A chain. There was a lot of, oh, so you've heard about the knitting. Yeah, the knitting went on. Margot also, um, yeah, she was fabulous. Yeah. Yeah, they were fabulous with her. There's, a, um, there's a, a great scene in episode 235 where you threaten Doreen in the dining room. You actually say, listen here, my tubby little friend. <laughs> Colin, put a bridle of that. I'm in here for murder. I could always add one more. Betty Bobbitt was next to Colette Mann, and then in the laundry, you threatened Judy for the press. What was it like working with Colette? You also threw Colette up against the wall. In I think it was awful. What an awful thing to remember. Uh, Colette was very funny. Very, very, very funny. That's, that's the first thing I have to say about her. She's a funny person and um, just, just a great storyteller and and yeah, so she would have seen the funny side of it. But the, the key was to stay straight faced sometimes, you know, when they'd said something funny and you had to go in there with your fist. Um, it was, uh, that was often, that was often hard. The funniest part, I thought, you know, in the, in the laundry was, you know, the press, you know, when we all wanted to boss of the press, it was never on. <laughs> right. So there, there was no, there was no electricity. It was never, it was never, uh, you know, actually a press and it wasn't hot. So, but there was a man lying underneath it with a, a steam gun. And so when I went, he went, and the steam would come up. And sometimes if I thought about that, if I thought, here's I, here am I doing that? And he, he was he going, <laughs> with the steam gun, I, I, I'd get a, bit, a little bit giggly too, because it was funny. So we had to do a lot of acting and being hot and being, you know, burnt and things like that. And I think I burnt my hand at one point under it. Um, so there's a lot of, that was that was real acting. That was me pretending a lot. <laughs> with the steam gun, you know. Ken, sorry, you know who the uh, the guy was that did the steam for the press? Uh, a few of the different props people, and they were mostly, uh, I think, pretty well all the male. Uh, guys, Paul Barnett may have done it. Uh, he became a cameraman later on. Um, Mark Daw um, was another one who who um, would have been around. And, and uh, there were there were other guys that yeah, uh, there were lots of guys in there. They were really nice. Mark Collins also, um, who later became a cameraman too. Yeah, they were lovely, lovely people. <laughs> I think they saw the funny side of it too. But they were very professional. They didn't laugh at the time, but I'd get the giggles thinking about it because it was, you know, just funny. Um, also on episode 235, I actually watched this scene uh, a few weeks ago. There's a great scene of you in the laundry, speaking of the press, on the press, and B walks in and everyone's just like, you know, it's a, it's a bit of an intense scene as you're operating it, you know, full of life and everyone's looking. What was that first scene like with Val to shoot? That's when she comes back. When she comes back in after she's been away, is that right? And um, I think so. And, yes. and I hand the press over to her straight away. Yeah, is that right? Is that the scene? Um, yeah, you yeah, know, it was it was great. It was a good scene. And actually, it was um, it was a it was Sandy showing she was a bit of a smart cookie. She wasn't gonna go. She wasn't gonna go head to head with the with the old guard. She was going to play it careful. And I thought, uh, and that was a good scene for that reason, wasn't it? It was that coming in and saying, oh, no, it's all yours. Nothing to do with me. It's uh, <laughs> probably in her heart of heart. She was thinking, yeah, I could topple her. But she was just yeah. having a little think and, and playing it cool for the time being. Yeah, there's lots of that. Lots of that in the scripts, actually. Uh, that sort of understanding that people need to negotiate their way, uh, which I think was really clever. Um, episode 236, written by Brian Williams, everybody's favourite Dr Weissman, uh, was directed by Rod Hardy, 
who is joining us for episode 20. Yeah, um, Rod directed a lot of it. He was terrific. He was really nice too. Yes, mm. he will be on uh, episode 20 of Talking Prisoner. The yeah. cameramen were Peter Hind, Robin Reed, and myself. Um, this is the second episode in, and we see Sandy Edwards really rising to the top. Great fight scene in the rec room. You're bashing up Andrea Hennessy, played by Bethany Lee. Bethany, we just, yes. We just saw an inmate hang herself because of Andrea. Great yeah. fight scene with Queen B watching, just watching on. What was it like to shoot that scene? I think I needed help because I don't think I'd ever, you know, gone in with my fists before. We didn't do that at the girls' school I went to. <laughs> and I, I remember at the time, again, going back to being how young I was, at the time I remember thinking, I'll just do it. It's fine. It's, I'll do it. But when I got to do it, I didn't really know. And if you have a look at it, I'm actually slapping rather than punching. I, I didn't really know how to, to hit uh, and it, it's, I can see how I'm a bit out of my depth in that one. I, when, I, when I've when i seen that, I've thought, hmm, that could have been improved. I could have been a real bashing and it wasn't. But maybe it didn't show up. It's, I can see it, though. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit ineffectual, a bit un, uncertain I look how good. to go about it. You think it looked all right, didn't you? Yeah, well, I watched it as well. Yeah, it looked good. <laughs> if you have a look, you see, I, I haven't actually got my fists. I don't know how. I don't know. It was all right. <laughs> okay, so this is a bit of a long one because there's a few actual comments about this um, about this scene. So episode 240, which was written by the amazing Ian Bradley, who was on episode four of Talking Prisoner, directed by Lee Spence, cameramen were Ken Mulholland, Peter Hind, and Barry Pullen. So there's a scene with you, B, and Kate. You tell B that you want to be top dog and B agrees. The girls are loving you as top dog. And there's a lot of comments from fans on all the YouTube videos about Sandy becoming top dog. So a couple of them are Sandy is a proper top dog. She's got a decent code of honor and sticks to it even when tested by people she dislikes and for good reason. That's the kind of women to get behind and who inspires respect, unlike the likes of Margot Gaffney. <laughs> Um, the way Sandy dealt with the situation regarding B in the dining room and also the one in the corridor involving Doreen's biscuit theft further indicates she has all the makings of a fine top dog. And there's, there's, a, there's hundreds more about you being top dog. So are you aware of how many fans are still talking about how they wanted Sandy to be? That's so nice. No, I wasn't aware of that. Uh, thank you. That's really nice to hear that. Thank you, everyone. Um, I uh, I have to I have to keep going back to the writers. They created that character, and uh, yeah, I, sometimes I it was kind of an ironic thing that I'm supposed to have murdered people, and I and I think I murdered a couple of people while I was in it, wasn't didn't I? Um, and and yet I had a sort of a supposed to have a sense of justice, which is um, strange, I guess. But I'm glad I did. I'm really glad that, that um, there, was some, there was some sort of nuance between being all bad and all good, that there was something coming on as conflict, which made her a bit more real. And um, it probably suited my, uh, the way I wanted to portray her. I don't know that I could have been dead set bad all the way through. Uh, and I couldn't have been dead set good all the way through either, really. I, I really liked that, that mixing of stuff. Um, and it was, it was, they were nice scripts. They were really nice scripts. And it was nice to be able to exercise a bit of vulnerability sometimes and, um, and that toughness, uh, which, yeah, I'm not actually an overly tough person. So I, I, it was, it was a good, that was a good acting challenge. Um, but um, there was a scene in it uh, towards the end where I, I heard that my husband had been killed. He, he was in another prison, apparently. A country, yes. Yeah, that's right. And um, there was a really nice scene. I think Rod might have uh, directed that one too. Uh, I'm not sure. Or Lex. And um, 
and I I said there that there was nothing left for me. There was nothing left for me because the only person who had ever loved me was gone. And there was nothing left in this miserable world. And I thought that was, I really liked being able to show that vulnerability, that, you know, the fact that I was a criminal, married to a criminal, doesn't make me very vulnerable. But in fact, vulnerability is everywhere really, isn't it? And it was nice to be able to, to exhibit that. And I really liked that. Amazing. And I can't remember who the director was, but I think it was Lex Allrod in that. Well, this next one is Lex, episode 241, written by Ray Cole and directed by Lex Van Oss. This episode, we see Lizzie Birdsworth back in Wentworth. You had some great scenes with Sheila Florence, and we, we asked all our guests if they have a special story they can share about Sheila. Yeah, sure. And I, I, first of all, I'd like to say something about Ray Colley, the writer. Uh, I worked with him later in, in Neighbours and I got to know him really well. And he'd been in the industry such a long time, and was a great guy and has written so many episodes um, of various shows. Uh, also a very gentle, vulnerable and, and sweet man to be writing all those tough characters. I really liked that about him. So I'd like to say first that... Yeah, he's a great writer. Um, uh, Lizzie, Sheila, was um, nothing like her character. I'm sure everyone has told you that. She was uh, clever and insightful and uh, she really quick-witted. And um, spending time with her in the green room was really nice. She had so much life experience. And she was English formally and had spent... she lived through the Blitz in London. Uh, that, she was an amazing person, really amazing, and a really great actor. Um, she was incredibly supportive to me, incredibly su supportive of me that, that I was pregnant and was really excited about the baby and really helped me to be really excited about it too. And, and so just a, a all-round good person, but funny and terrific. And that character... That, that was a great character, wasn't it? I think I've met people like Lizzie Birdsworth in my journey through life. I've come across people like that who, you know, who just get on and do stuff, get on with their life and don't feel sorry for themselves, which she never did, did she? She just got on and was as nice to people as she could be. And I really liked that character. She was a real, she was a cup half full kind of person, really, yeah. who just did her best. And hadn't been dealt a very good hand, I think. That was what was so nice about the character. Really admired it. Yeah, we've, we've fed us some really amazing memories from cast members about Sheila. It's been great. Yeah, she's yeah. quite, a, quite someone. Mm. Just want to quickly go on uh, episode 244 because there are some fans that are asking, and you were right in the middle of it, was the inmates' uniform change. Mm. So yeah, it was. The new uniforms. Do, do you know what the reason was for the new uniforms? Anyone? I think it was an artistic reason. Well, I, Ken, do you know? Um, I think um, I think the, the threads had gotten to the threads to, to a certain extent, and, and that's why they needed to um, update. And it also may have been um, uh, something to do with colour. Uh, so, not that yeah. colour came in, you know, at that time, but but um, just to uplift it a little bit, just the, the gingham was a little bit brighter. Um, but I, I don't actually know for sure. Yeah, yeah. I, know, I think that I think you're actually spot on. I think, um, you know, while Prisoner was a, a kind of a monochromy kind of show, even though it was in colour, there were really simple colours, that denim colour, a lot of grey, occasional the red brick of the walls there wasn't much, and gray blankets on the beds and stuff like that there wasn't much color in it and the original denim dresses were you know you had a jumper underneath or a shirt but they tended to be just the blue the gray and the black and a bit and I think there was an artistic decision that they needed to zhuzh it up a little bit so they had those kind of I think they were, were they button they were button dresses, weren't they? And and there was a choice of three shirts, so you could have the yellow check or the blue check, blue and pink check, and maybe there was another one. I'm not sure. 
um, which I can't just 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 put a little bit of colour into the into the um, scenes, which you know a lot of thought goes into that kind of thing. I think that I think that might have been the reason why. It's funny, you know, um, you know, if I go looking for something to wear, <laughs> sometimes you know there's a lot of denim dresses around. I put one over my head and go. Yeah, I can't wear that. <laughs> I can't wear that now. <laughs> I can't. So I, I, I don't go around in getting dresses. Even though I love them and they look nice, every time I put them on, I think, yeah, no. <laughs> 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 um, so I don't wear them. I wear jeans. But, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, they've um, changed everyone's thought about fashion. Sorry, Ken. Gen Jennifer Carmen, uh, I don't know whether you re remember Jennifer. Um, who was in wardrobe. Um, yes, I do. I knew, I knew I knew the name, yes. Yes, she would be the lady that may be able to tell us definitively what, uh, why the change in, in the clothing. Yeah, um, she would. Yeah. yeah. It was We're an interesting show to dress, wasn't it? It was an interesting show to dress because you had to show changes in character and changes in people, but you ha all had the same uniform on. So, I mean, that was a real challenge for her. I know she always let us wear warm tights and comfortable shoes, always. She didn't. So, you know, we spent a lot of time in those uniforms and I wore really solid, comfortable shoes and and uh, it was, yeah, it was better than the poor the poor kids in bikinis. <laughs> so nice. Speaking of um, denim dresses and going out, were you, when you were in prison or after prison, were you recognised a lot out in the street when you were out? I was, yes, I was. Um, and uh, it was my haircut, I suppose. I, if I kept my hair short, sometimes I'd change my hair. And a few years ago, around about, only a few years ago, so, and I'm old, much older. Not that old. I'm much older. But I had my hair cut and it must have been like a prisoner cut and I wasn't aware of it. But I walked down the street and people, a couple of people stopped me and said, are you from prisoner? And I... I hadn't had that for a long time, and I think it was the way the hairdresser had done my hair. Wow. So sometimes, and I wear specs most, I mean, I always did wear specs, but I didn't have them on for prisoner, but I, I um, I'm so old now, I do need them to see your faces. <laughs> um, uh, so I didn't feel that I looked so much like it, the character, but I think it was the haircut that did it. People did recognise me even recently. But back then, yeah, there was a period that it was quite a lot. Yeah, a lot of people. And, and everyone would have had that, everyone, and much more than me. I think Elspeth uh, tended to go shopping very late or night or very early in the morning. <laughs> yes, she'd occasionally go down to Forest Hills still in the prisoner uniform, and, of course, she'd get flooded by people. <laughs> that was terrible. I think I did it too. Betty used to do it. I think I went down there with Betty once. I just put a coat on. And she said, oh, I'll be all right, I'll be all right. And it actually was. I think people in Forest Hill got very used to seeing us. <laughs> and, 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 yeah, they just go, oh, this them again. <laughs> so that it, they were all right. But, but sometimes I think people, people like, like Colette and Betty and, and Elspeth and Val would certainly get stopped. And, and um, Sheila, of course. Someone actually, who, who was it, Ken, that told us a story? They went down a Forest Hill in their uniforms and someone was about to call the police thinking they were yes <laughs> 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 just told us that um what do i mean margo yeah. Knight, i think <laughs> yeah possible although if we we're really escaped prisoners we'd have the wit to change our clothes don't you think <laughs> yeah she would have thought so and, and become <laughs> nuns become nuns or something like that yeah, something, that's right. something, <laughs> something else Funny. <laughs> no, I don't know how we were allowed to do that. That's a funny thing, isn't it? It was so close, and you think, "Oh, let's just go out there for lunch," because normally we just had lunch in. But um, uh, and they'd say, "Oh, come on, we just put a coat on." And sometimes wardrobe would let us have a little coat. We'd put it on, just run down. I don't know we were allowed. I, on other shows I worked for in, you wouldn't be allowed to do that, but we were. We did. Yeah. If it's probably health and safety or something or other, there some, would be some regulation now that would stop you. Uh, episode 245, which was written by Rick Mayer, directed Rick Mayer, by, yes. by Juliana Fox, 
cameramen were John Galvin, Barry Pullen, and uh, I was there too. Um, the lead up to the big riot, which is called by many fans, the Sandy Edwards riot, we see the introduction of Mari Winter played by Maggie Miller. What was it like working with Maggie? Um, many fans say that this was the best era of Prisoner. She created a really scary character, didn't she? Mari was scary. Maggie wasn't. Maggie was a, a really good person. She was a nice person. I used to drive her home sometimes because she was staying close by. Um, just a terrific person. Uh, she's a, she went to RADA. She was a really um, clever and talented woman. Uh, and, since, and I've seen her in lots of things, and she's always been a good, really good actress. Um, she was great. She was great to work with. That, uh, that, but she was, she was quite frightening. She created a real chill around, you know, that character. When she was in character she, on the set, you know, we'd walk together from the green room to the set, and we'd be, you know, chatting, and and then on the set, she she became a, a very formidable character, and you know, Sandy was meant not to be uh, intimidated easily. So I had to use all my powers not to be, because she was very effective as a frightening character, a frightening character that didn't have a, a, a particularly strong moral compass, which is why I think that's the kind of thing that makes someone frightening, isn't it? You know, with Sandy, they sort of, you know, they said, oh, she has a, she knows what justice is. So you kind of know where you stand. But with Mari, you never knew where you stood. That's really scary, isn't it? Yeah. She was great. Just great. Yeah. yeah such a great character. Um, episode 247, 248, 249, which Ken just mentioned was called by all the fans, the great Sandy Edwards riot. Uh, it was written by Ian Bradley. Well, it is. It's the unofficial <laughs> title. <for that. laughs> Good. Um, Ian I'm Bradley. So, I'm so excited. A riot name after me. <laughs> now, help me if I get something wrong here, Ken. So it was written by Ian Bradley. The script editor was Ian Smith. Storyliners were John Mortimore, Andrew Kennedy, Dave Worthington, Michael. Now, this is where I'm going to slip up. F R E U N D T. Um, any volunteers? Freud. F R E U N D T. Michael Freud. Yeah. Freud. Okay. Sorry, Michael. Cameraman Ken Mulholland, Peter Hine, Barry Pullen, and directed by Lee Spence. So, can you share your memories of the riot with the fans? Because the fans say this was one of the greatest riots in Wentworth in the show's entire run. <laughs> ah wow! Ah, okay, okay. There were there were. I remember two. The riot was when we took over completely, and there was another one when, uh, yeah, Sandy jumped to the floor and ran outside, screaming that they weren't allowed to bring the uh, the cops in. I think I should have watched this before I came no, on. It's a long time ago. Um, that was one of the ones where, uh. When I talked about continuity, you shot your outside stuff the week before you shot your inside stuff. So you had to keep track of how enraged you were on the outside because I think there was a scene on the outside where I was shouting and then I burst inside, which was a week later, and I had to burst in at that same level of anger. And that was, you know, so you had to make notes and make mental notes and really think about where you're at. Is that how <laughs> Is that hard, to do? Is that hard to do, to go back to that anger that you had in the film? You have to remember. You have to remember so you can find it again. You have to remember what, you know, if you gave yourself a number of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 for anger and you left that scene at number 8, you've got to come into the inside scene at number 8 as well. And that, yeah, I, yeah, I suppose it is hard to do, but you being aware of it is really important. Um, and then you can they can do it. But I remember that there was a lot of that. So I was going out of scenes at some level. I had to find that same level to come into the next scene at. So I was keeping the continuity going. I, I don't know whether I succeeded all the time, but but yeah, you're thinking about when you're doing things like that. You're thinking about that all the time. Where you have to be, where you have to have to pitch your emotions. And I think that's uh, that's a challenge. And sometimes 
those scenes are about that. You're thinking so hard about that, you're not even aware of the, of the drama of the scene rolling on. Um, you've got to thank the people in the editing suite and the directors because they're the ones that, that knit it together, you know, and, and cover up imperfections. And, yeah, so it's a, it's a real group effort. You know, it's fantastic. The mm. edit suite's amazing, the way they can cut through things. And if you mispronounce something, they can somehow get it running the right way. And, oh, it's just, it's just amazing. But that was that, that took place over uh, a couple of weeks, I think, that riot. And we did, there was a lot of chaos. That's right, getting the chaos. So the continuity people were really hard strapped to keep up with that. Especially if you know you you rip someone's cloak, they have to be ripped properly the next week and things like that. So yeah, it's an amazing industry, isn't it? It is. I know little bits of it. You know, I know my little bits of it, but you know, there's a whole lot of other people doing astonishing things all around makeup and things like that. So in in actual fact, that that those three uh, episodes would have taken what? A couple of weeks to to put together or, or yes, one could take us I, I, mean, I, I can't remember how they were spread out could mm. it could have taken up to three weeks couldn't they yeah 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 because you do all your outside broadcasts first yeah. <clears throat> with the scene from the last week yeah yeah well, two weeks certainly yeah maybe even three speaking of uh outside broadcasts so there was a scene outside the loading bay at night where the all the officers are holding their rifles when you guys That's are throwing yeah. fire bombs. What was it like shooting that scene? <laughs> it's it's freezing it. cold. I remember it being really, really cold. And we were just outside the studios. You know, it's in the studios at Channel 10, what was Channel 10. Um, uh, so we're using the studio walls to make it look like a prison wall. Um, and running inside. So you're standing around a lot, you know, television and film is a lot, a lot of standing around, as, as I'm sure you know. Um, so you have to, yeah, the hard part is getting that emotion up, getting your, your adrenaline up after you've been standing there in the cold for 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and then suddenly say, okay, you're on. And you then you have to beat yourself up to get into that that angry moment, don't you? It was great. That was, the, that was one of the ones where I, I went out and I was shrieking. And then when I came back in, it was a week later, and I had to keep that shriek, that real anger going. And that was some, a real challenge. Yeah. And it, it looked really cold, because I remember the next morning there was a scene with Patsy King coming to the prison, and they're, they're all blowing fog out of their mouths. It was yeah. freezing. <laughs> we shot it late at night, I remember. And mostly, you know, you didn't do too many late night shoots in that particular show because it's mostly interiors but um every now and then we did and that was quite late at night it was midwinter we shot it so it went to air in october did you say or november yeah, but so. we would have shot it in july or august i think wow so um, it was really really cold some of those riot scenes would have been physically demanding did you find it hard to shoot such physical scenes at times yeah, scenes take about two minutes or, or one minute of time. So, you know, you're not physically demanding because you're probably, you're shooting a scene, then they're setting up for the next scene you're going in. So you're resting all the time in between. As I say, it's maintaining the, um, yeah. the adrenaline level that's the hard part. But, um, uh, yeah, I, I, they're hard to block. I imagine the director had a lot of trouble working out where people should be and then we had a lot of trouble remembering where we had to be. You, you had to take a lot of direction to get it right so they can get the camera angles right. So you had to, I guess the tiring part was concentrating, really concentrating hard so that you knew you had to be here and then there and then there and then you hit somebody and you punch someone and then you did something else. <laughs> uh, so that the camera will pick it up at the right time. I think there were, Ken, were there three cameras? Three uh, cameras. On the, on the OBs. Uh, no, not on the OBs, on the-, on the um, In the studio, interior. three, yeah. Three. Yeah. So I think OB only had one camera, didn't it? Um, sometimes, sometimes there were two guys out there. Um, I'm not quite sure because I didn't do much in the way of location. But um, 
uh, in, in the studios, three cameras, but sometimes it, there would be a one camera, single camera shoot, mm. um, you know, in a corridor or something like that as well. Yeah. yeah. It's fascinating. It really is fascinating, isn't it? I, I loved seeing the way they edited it all together. That was really great. Really exciting. Mm. There's, a, there's um, also a, a classic scene in the governor's office where you and the inmates find Steve Faulkner on the photo on the phone to the cops and you throw him to the desk desk and, and strip him. What was it like to shoot that scene and how did Wayne feel about it? I think Wayne probably tolerated it, but I, but to, I can't remember why I stripped him actually. I, I'm trying to think. I think that must have been just um, television land colour because I can't see why I would do it otherwise. But um, it, there was probably a little tiny bit of hilarity connected with that, a little bit of a, okay, okay. Um, uh, maybe I stripped him so that he couldn't get away quickly or something like that, I forget. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was, they were, they were always good scenes. It was great having stuff to do. It was really great having stuff to do and you could put your, your head into it and your, and, and um and you're all you're learning into it really. It was good fun doing all that stuff. And he was a good sport. He was a good sport. Yeah, it was a fun yeah, I did terrible things to people, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> now we get on to episode 265, which was written by Ian Bradley and directed by Lex Van Os. Now, this is the one of one of the most talked about episodes. It's got one of the most biggest conspiracy theories about it probably more than who shot JR on Dallas. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> well, it's spoken about a lot. So obviously at the end of uh, the episode, you're going out to uh, kill Kate Peterson. You've told yeah. Murray about it. And you're both walking to the bins and the dump trucks come in and take And all of a sudden. Then the, you're gone. And, and Dr. Kate walks back in and, and the, the look on Mari's face is absolutely... It's absolutely priceless because she's expecting you to walk back in. And then uh, very cleverly at the end, we see the truck drive out the gates, but it's filming underneath. And then... Mm, yeah, that's, that's right. It. Yeah. <laughs> like, there are lots of theories, aren't there? <laughs> There's actually fights on uh, Facebook groups between fans on what really happened to Sandy Edwards. Now, it's, it's a known fact that we know that you fell pregnant, obviously, on the show. But could you put what you think happened to Sandy? Okay. I, I, first of all, I'd like to say that everybody's theories are possibly correct because well, one thing there wasn't ever... <laughs> Sorry, say that again, Matt. There's a lot. One, one, one fan even said that Steve Faulkner helped you escape and you went off to live in another, another country. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. Well, none of them are wrong because there was never... Uh, a, um, a definitive uh, explanation, even to us, right? But never. Um, so what the reality was that I was pregnant, and I think I was about six months pregnant then, and I'd been hanging my, holding my stomach in a lot and um, carrying around baskets of laundry in front of me. In fact, I think props you should just throw a basket of laundry at me and say, hold that. Um, so I had to leave. Um, there had been uh, some talk of bringing in the pregnancy. That's which is why I had the um, on-air affair with Wayne Jarrett's character. Um, but because my husband was in Sydney and it was our first baby, I really felt that I needed to go to Sydney. So I said, no, I think perhaps thank you very much, but I'd better go. So th this thing came up and it was left open whether I died or not, because we didn't know what we wanted to do and they didn't know what they wanted to do. They might have had stories that went on, I might have been able to come back or not, depending. So there was a lot of openness. Uh, and I think so any of the theories are possibly correct. And I think the implication that Kate killed me is certainly a strong one. I don't like to think Sandy died though. I really don't. I felt like she had... She had that cockeyed optimism, even though she'd been through a rough life, that and her a desire to survive that was really strong. And I reckon she made all the plans. She's going to kill her. 
She's going to go out. She's going to do what, and everyone was expecting it. But just as she had stepped away from the press when B came in and said, no, you know, you're the top dog, she was capable of planning and uh, tricking people. And I think, I think she said, it's time I left. It's got too hot. It's got hard. It's got too hot. A couple of bad things have happened. Mari's out of control. Kate's out of control. I need to look after number one. And I think she would have looked after number one. And I think she had plans. And she thought she might try and mount an escape. And I think she somehow got into that truck. But then I don't know how she got into the truck without being squished. So I haven't thought that one all the way through. But I think there's a possibility that Sandy got out and got away yeah. and yeah. either complete continued her life of crime successfully or maybe changed. <laughs> you never know. That but was, I would like to say that Peter, Peter, that. Peter sorry. sorry, go on, Matt. No, that's what I'm saying. That's what's so clever about that scene with the truck driving out was you, you didn't know. No. Yeah. No. It's good, that, it's good really in a way. But, a bit, but, but my theory, the one I hold in my heart, is that she actually got away and she might have been able to turn her life around, although possibly not, <laughs> but, but she got away and didn't get brought back in. So maybe she survived. I don't know. I don't know. But I was going to say... Um, the cameraman Peter Hind presented me with a um, uh, a little uh, garbage truck <laughs> as a gift, as his parting gift as I left, and I have it for years. Now I don't have it now because my own children played with it so much. Eventually, went the way of all things, but I did have it for a long, long, long time. Peter, if you're ever listening to this, so thank you for my garbage truck. <laughs> Can I, just before Ken asks his next question, so the writers did want to keep you in with the pregnancy. That was floated around, that storyline. That was floated, yes. That yep. was definitely floated. That was why there was that me, I think there was the character in um, Solitary Confinement and she actually ended up um, uh, sleeping with uh, uh, Wayne Jarrett's character, Steve. Um, and I think that's what they wanted. They thought that would be the a good way of keeping it going. Um, but uh, anyway, that's that's history now. And I probably wouldn't have worked out for me so well, you know, yeah. first babies. Yeah. I was very keen to be home with my husband. Definitely. Well, thank you for putting an end to every conspiracy theory. Oh, I don't think I have. I'm sure they're all right. I'm sure they're all correct. That was just my theory. <laughs> there's, there's more to come. There's more to come. Um, the uh, the next question that I was going to ask was um, or has already been been uh, answered. So I'm I'm going to go down to the fan comments on the Sandy Edwards mystery. This is the uh, this is London Underground S H R and Retro. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what who and what that is. But Sandy's Vanishing Act is an iconic moment in the history of Prisoner. It remains a mystery, but you could come to your own conclusions. It may be that Peterson overcame Sandy somehow, then bundled her into the garbage truck, truck where she was crushed to death. Her body was never found. <laughs> that's, that's the London Underground's comment. Yes, and then it's um, a good one. it is Karen Nichols said, funny, I was thinking that Sandy's disappearance was the only real mystery in Prisoner. Personally, I think Kate killed her and put her in the garbage truck, but we'll never know until now. No. Um, G. Quinn also says, I think Kate killed Sandy. Sandy was planning to escape all right, but not right then. Her main aim was to kill Kate first. Kate, however, got more and more crazy by the minute with her bad nerves and fear. In some cases, people with mental health problems to the extreme can produce an unexpected level of strength and power. Kate probably just flipped, defending herself. Sandy, as a result, was caught off guard. By fluke, Kate got the upper hand, got the knife from her in a struggle and stabbed her. 
and we could mention hundreds more, but let's just say that Sandy Edwards' storyline was a huge hit on Prisoner. There is oh, a great. hashtag on Facebook, uh, hashtag Sandy Lives. Which is a big hashtag. <laughs> That's really nice. That's really nice. I think they're all really good theories, but uh, I and possibly correct, but I fall back on Sandy's survival instinct. Okay, that's the thing I always think about. And I think about, uh, yeah, Kate was Kate was scary. And as, as I say, people you can't predict are often the most scary, which is what was so fabulous about the Mari, Trevor, uh, the Mari, um, uh, Mari's character. But uh, I think that Sandy, well, she might have been caught off guard, but I think she had, she had a lot of street smarts, which Kate didn't have. Kate was too privileged. She didn't have the street smarts. So yeah. I'm hoping Sandy street smart, street smart, street smarts held her in good stead. There's just literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of comments about that. And oh. actually, someone even edited some clips of Wayne Jarrett on the phone. They just took scenes from other episodes and put them <gasps> together to make it look like he's helping you escape. They go, this it is what was so clever. Right, yeah. <laughs> so he's going, yeah, I'll organise that soon. Sandy Edwards. <laughs> that would have been that would have been great. It would be nice for Sandy Edwards to have someone who loved her, I think. She was somebody looking to be loved. Loved, yeah. Who, you know, you know, things fell apart for her and I maybe he was the one. Maybe he was her saviour in the end. That's a nice thought. I know we're taking up some of your time, but you mind if we can just run through some fan questions? Is that okay? Sure. Awesome. Um, funnily enough, it was exactly, uh, sorry, we also, I mentioned that. That was okay. We'll go on to Ken's question. Um, uh, you did have one, there were hundreds of, oh no, uh, Christian Garrard? Yeah, uh, I mentioned about the episode being 40 years ago to this day. Okay, Connor Muller says, hi Louise, what are your memories of working with Maxine Clinton Gatus or killing alligators as we <laughs> uh, on neighbours? Um, yes, memories of, of Maxine. Maxine was great. She was um, uh, really bright. She was such a high energy person and she looked fantastic. She had all lots of blonde, wavy hair and she was intense. It was a great character she had, and I really liked her too. She's good fun, nice person. Because you worked with her on Neighbours as well, didn't you? She came into Neighbours. I didn't have a lot to do with her on Neighbours, I have to say. But, yeah, uh, the thing about being in the writing department was um, I didn't always see a lot of the actors. Yep. Occasionally we would catch up uh, when I was out of the studio sort of once uh, every few weeks. But mostly we tended to work in a little bit of a... Um, you know, vacuum. <laughs> That's the nature of it, I think. Yeah. Um, Janice Robertson's got two questions. What was the best thing about playing Sandy? And are there any similarities between you and her, which we've sort of touched on? <laughs> uh, so who asked that question? Janice, Janice Robertson from the UK. Hi. Hi, Janice. Um, uh, it was a challenge. Uh, because I was a real big learning experience for me and it was a great challenge playing that character and getting a little bit of vulnerability into her and and that toughness and I whether she's like I guess you try and find the when you're looking at a character you try and find the bits that you can relate to um, so somewhere along the line there's something about it that was me but mm, I don't know, I think if you're looking at this, you might be able to observe bits of her that were like me, but I don't know. I don't know that I am. Um, I don't think I've had that lack of luck she'd had in her life. She'd had a tough life, that character. Mm -hmm. And and uh, and I think that's what that was what was so nice about her, so noble about her, really, because she was tough, but she wasn't really mean. She was, yeah, yeah vulnerable. Um, Arthur uh, said, uh, wrote Drew in the uh, episode of Neighbours, which was Scottish themed. 
How much did you know about Scotland before writing the episodes? And have you been to Scotland? It was a great episode, by the way. I loved it. Oh, that's great. Thanks. Um, well, uh, first of all, uh, Judith Cahoon created that character of Drew Kirk. And when we were talking about the wedding, it, I said, who, who lived in country Victoria, and I, and I remember having a discussion and suggesting that uh, Drew Kirk is a, Andrew Kirk is a good Scottish name. So maybe he has a lot of Scottish relatives and we could say that they're recent uh, settlers from uh, Scotland to Australia and um, maybe they call in the clans when it's a wedding time and it, it just seemed like such a colourful thing to go with um, that we would do it and, and that was uh, took a lot of planning. I haven't been to Scotland but you know I'm you know from English and Irish stock and French stock and I, uh, I have a, I've read a, read a lot I guess it's not the same as going there, I know. Um, but uh, we did a lot of... And Judith Cahoon, with a name like Cahoon, she, she knew a lot about Scotland. So we did a lot of research. We found some uh, actors who could do Scottish accents. <laughs> and, um, and we tried to find a tartan that would work for them um, because Judith knew all about, you know, who could wear what tartan, which I didn't know anything about. So it was quite a learning thing for me. It was really exciting. And then we uh, used, the other thing we did was we used that lovely uh, poem uh, by Robbie Burns and uh, set to music. And we knew that we had a great singer on the cast in the form of Ian Smith. Oh. And, uh, you know, these people with hidden great talents that weren't necessarily part of their character. So we, uh, so we got together and thought we'd bring that, that, that song in, which is a song I used to sing to my children when they were little. So I, I was very familiar with it. Will you go, Lassie, go, that one. And, um, and the, the characters thought they, they'd do it, but we had Ian come in to help because we knew that he would carry that off brilliantly, and he did. So it was good fun. It was really good fun. There was a lot of fun stuff about writing these. A lot of fun, you know, the the brief was to be family and fun, actually. So we tried to do that as much as possible. Fantastic. The next, the next brief is uh, just a simple statement from Anthony Burroughs. The Sandy Kate Mari period was my absolute favorite. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I had a great time too. And, and uh, I was working with such good actors, such good actors. It was just a pleasure to do. And it was a big team thing and really grateful that you liked it so much because it was great fun too. Yeah. I think we sort of covered the next question by Kai Atherton was, I always wanted to know, was it an intentional experiment to bring in new characters like Sandy and Kate? and have the old guard of B, Lizzie, Doreen and Judy take a back seat? Was it a way for the producers and writers to know if the show could work with a change to their principal cast? But you did explain that Val was uh, taking a movie part at the time. So I guess that really... That's part of it, yeah. But, the, but, but it's true that ongoing shows need new characters because you can't, once you've got a character, and you've done a whole lot of stories with them, you can't change their character to create new stories. So sometimes you have to bring in somebody else who will impact on those characters, which generates new stories. And if they're popular enough, they stay around. Um, so it's, yeah, it, it was good for the show, but those characters, those established characters were so popular, no one would have wanted to get rid of them. So they had to be part of the the ongoing stories uh, and think about a prison you know it's like a, a hospital drama you've got people coming in all the time don't they? coming in and going out all the time that's the nature of it they you know in the industry they say oh the stories walk in the door and they do that's why <laughs> hospital dramas are so popular too <laughs> ollie james says uh, can you also share some of your favorite stories of interaction with other cast members on set and off 
were there any cast members that you were close to during your time on Prisoner or any that you didn't really get on with? It was a, it was a cast that was committed to getting on, I have to say, and that's a, something that I really admire. It was a cast that, you know, was turning out a show, turning out a, a, a show in a very fast space of time doing I think we were doing three and a half episodes a week that's a lot and um so yeah there was a big commitment to getting it right but the people I started with Olivia and Kate Sheil and Wayne I felt really strongly connected with and then um Maggie Miller came in and I felt strongly connected to her I was very I, I really appreciated um uh, as I said before Betty and Colette and um, Elspeth was just kindness itself, really. They were good people, really good people. I enjoyed them so much. But there was, you know, it's like a workplace, like any workplace. Uh, personalities are ones you are drawn to, some you're not so drawn to, some you work at being friends with, some you don't have to work at because they're just natural friends. You know, it's a workplace and uh, it's in the best interest of the workplace to get on. So, I mean, you know. Yeah. doesn't pay to uh, cause any friction. So there was a, a, a real sense of, you know, we're getting on, we're doing the job, it should be done that way. That's one thing I've learned <laughs> in these podcasts, is that, yeah, cast and crew all got along really well to produce, you know, the show that it was. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, Kyle Murphy said, this is amazing having you on. Um, <laughs> Sandy was one of my favourite characters in the whole series. Such a great era for Prisoner. Would you please ask Louise, did she ever audition for any other role in Prisoner? Oh, we, we have touched on your audition, so we did answer that, Kyle, but I did want to put in the comment about what he thought of you. And oh, Kyle, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, uh, and I had such a nice time doing it. I didn't ever audition for another role in Prisoner, um, uh, you know, some people do turn up in multiple roles in shows, don't they? Um, and if you can get away with it, that, that works. Um, but I did a lot of other stuff on other shows. I suppose all the shows on at the time I was doing little bits and pieces in. Um, uh, but Prisoner was really a great show, a great, and still is. It, you know, I think even though some storylines nowadays probably don't work and things like that, it still stands up as being a, a good vehicle for yeah. and, and yeah. an unusual show for the time, even for now. Thanks, Kyle. Stuart Kerry from Nottingham uh, echoes that those thoughts as well. I, he was he was a late uh, question that but he, he said much the same thing that Sandy was one of his favourites too. Um, Thanks, Stuart. Eugene DeGeorge says, hey guys, this should really be a great interview. Of all the characters, Sandy Edwards has always been a prominent feature of Prisoner. The Sandy Edwards riot, the Sandy Edwards mystery, you can't talk Prisoner without her name. Sandy Edwards coming up. Most of the questions I would ask have already been stated by other prisoner fans. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was such a pleasure to do. I, I feel like um, I, I got so much out of it, so much learning, so much growing up and, um, and friendships and uh, a great experience all around actually. And, and thanks to all the letters and, and the kind thoughts, people have been fantastic, really fantastic. And it's, it's been good, it's been good. Thank you, you guys too. Oh, thank you. We've still got more to come. Okay. <laughs> um, actually, we, we couldn't fit them all in. There was, as I said, there was, we were overwhelmed with questions for you on the uh, Talking Prisoner Facebook page. Um, Paul Chandler said, I love Sandy. This was the era when I first started watching in the early 90s. Those plots and characters had me hooked. I just wanted to say thank you for doing such a wonderful job to you. And uh, a bit late, I know, he said, um, but yeah, he just wanted to thank you. 
Oh, thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. And that's uh, uh, the writers have done a lot of that work, haven't they? And Lizzie Bird's work storyline that came in and out of it was always really, really positive and good, wasn't it? It was that great cross section of characters. I do have a question about just with Lizzie with the riot. Do you remember the scene with the um, where she went out the front with the white flag? <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> it was great, wasn't it? She was great. I wonder if she came up with that. I'm not sure. I remember standing with her in the back, waiting for our scene, just having conversations with her. Um, oh, she's she was fantastic. She was fantastic. <laughs> The, um, another another comment from James Gibson. I'll I'll just shorten this down a little bit because what he's asked has, has already been uh, answered, I think. But he he does say I always love to believe that Sandy actually escaped and sailed off into the sunset with Steve Faulkner on his boat. On his windsurfer, probably wouldn't it be very comfortable. <laughs> Yeah, that thanks. That I, I hope so too. I, I, you know, people need a good break in their life, and Sandy's character was somebody who needed a good break. And I think, you know, if I could give, you know, sometimes you just want to give something good to somebody, and that would have been a nice, a nice ending. Yeah, Mark Stubbs oh, said, so "Brilliant good. era for Prisoner." Sandy so deserved her own mugshot in the opening credits. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I think that was reserved for the long termers there. <laughs> uh, Baz Christek says, no questions. Just want to say thank you, Louise, for bringing to life a much-loved character that has stayed in our hearts for nearly 40 years. A true, oh, Baz. A true testament to your incredible acting, screen presence and damn right lovability. Oh, thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Baz. That's a really kind thing to say. Well, I feel a bit, a bit overwhelmed, really. <laughs> um, David J. Sid said, hi, Louise. Dave Siddons from the UK. Love Sandy on Prisoner. Later on in your own career, you wrote scripts for Neighbours, MDA, Headland. Were you ever asked to write for Prisoner? And if not, would you have liked to? Um, hi. Um, I would love to have, but it wasn't on. When I started writing, um, it wasn't on anymore. So that wasn't um, an issue. But I loved, I wrote for, I, I worked on Blue Heels too. I did a lot of um, editing for that. Um, and I loved MDA. Working for the ABC was fab. And MDA was one of those shows where I had to be really clever and I had to get things right. I had to do a lot of research. And that was really exciting, that medical drama. I enjoyed it so much. And then, you know, for years I taught television and film writing at, uh, in Melbourne at Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology and at um, Northern Metropolitan TAFE. And, uh, and I shared a lot of storylines and scripts and I taught people how to, how to write them for years. And I had a really good time doing that, learning about the structure of things. I've in a way, it served me. Prison has served me very well because it's it's allowed me to do other things. But that's at the base of it, you know. That's at the base of it. And I, I had such a good time doing it and being somebody that I probably was never going to be, Miss Ordinary, Miss... I mean, I'm a gar I like to garden. <laughs> and I keep cats <laughs> too. And I have a husband and some grandchildren. So, uh, you know, not as, quite as exciting a life as um, Sandy Edwards. <laughs> Acting gives you a, an insight into those lives, though, doesn't it? You get a chance to be someone that you might have admired from a distance but never had a chance to be. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Abby, Jessup, Abby Jessup says much the same thing, but, but she does finish off with saying, I always like to think that Sandy sailed off with Steve on his ship. <laughs> So that's, a a, that's a common theme, isn't it? So maybe I did. Yeah, yeah. That'd be, you know, there'd be worse things to do with that nice fella. Be lovely. Um, Raymond Kelly, yeah, we sort of covered 
most of this as well, but he did say one of my absolute favorite characters and eras of the show. And he did ask about what it was like working with um, Anne Hattie and uh, the riot scenes on Prisoner, but he said um, his regards from Scotland. Oh, hi. Hi. Hello in Scotland. I'm going to get there one day. <laughs> I guess we're not going anywhere at the moment, are we? Since right. this, the, COVID, uh, the COVID lockdowns, but... Um, but that too shall pass, and uh, and I'll be in Scotland. I think I'll, I'll go there. I'd love to see it. I watch all those documentaries, you know, about sailing around the Outer Hebrides that come on the BBC. <laughs> They're great. Gaz Smith <laughs> says, "Can't wait for this interview. One of my favourite characters. I had a lovely letter from uh, from you." and a photo from you as well, years ago, and also from Olivia Hamner. Oh, that's good. I'm glad they got through. We did a lot of letter writing. Um, I did it uh, actually when I, my kids were little. Um, my children were small and uh, uh, I was mostly at home with them. I did a lot of letter writing then. I, I, had, a, I had a stockpile and I, I, you know how when you're guilty about something, it burns a little hole in your mind and that stockpile of letters we just burn a little hole and eventually I, I sat down and I got a whole lot of pictures printed and I, I read I read all the letters, just, just to let you know, I did read them all and, I, and thank you very much, everyone. And I wrote back and I, I think I probably told people a bit about my life uh, at the time and, um, and, you know, how much fun it had been. And, um, yeah, oh, I can't keep on saying thank you, but thank you anyway. Um, Hembro, so we've already touched on one of his questions, but he said, Yes, 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 love the end of year, right? Cliffhanger. My question was what it was like to film that, which we've spoken about, but he also did ask, What was your favorite storyline on Prisoner that you did? Um, uh, yeah. I think it probably was the uh, there was somebody that came in and I killed. I can't remember much about that one. I liked, I liked that. And I liked the one towards the end when Kate uh, strung me up and there was that scene where I had to struggle to get um, released from a rope. Uh, and I thought that was, uh, I really liked doing that. I found that a really interesting thing to do. And I also liked when I stole the tablets for B at the beginning and stuck them in my bandage and uh, to give to her. That was, I don't know if it was an act of kindness or was an act of political kindness to try and get in with the top dog, but but um, it was a really nice little storyline and uh, probably a big challenge to the writers or getting that to, to coordinate properly. While B became ill, that was that thing where she became more and more ill and then she was taken away. To go yeah, I think it was a storyline with a kidney transplant. She needed. That's a right. That was what. Yeah. So they gave her the kidney transplant story to get her, so she could go and do the film. Val could do the film, and um, and that's when I took over. That's right. Yeah. John Walters says, "Can I ask Louise if she has a phobia of bin men? <laughs> has, she, has she been or been?" to the UK and say hello from John Walters in Manchester, UK. Hello, John. <laughs> uh, I don't have a phobia of bin men, I don't think. I am very grateful to them, really. Uh, uh, but I often think, I actually, I am reminded of that sequence quite often because bins are part of our lives, aren't they? Lots of bins these days. Um, I have been to the UK. I, I, uh, I went to Ireland and uh, I, I went, uh, I travelled around England and took a train to Liverpool and Manchester and looked around at the sites there. Uh, most Australians get there eventually, don't they? And, you know, walked around and looked at those blue, blue um, uh, uh, plaques that are on historic houses. Um, I'm a big reader and I like history and I, that was really exciting. Uh, I'd love to go there again. I'd love to go there and just spend a lot more time. It seems like it's, a, it, it's about, I think England's about the same size as Victoria, where I live, but there is so much packed into it. 
it's an incredible um it's an incredible place yeah. and it turns yeah. out some of the best television i've ever seen that's some great tv yeah. I, just speaking of bin man I, it was a few years ago i, I saw a comment on a youtube episode of that and I, and I was trying to find it the other night so i could so i could read it to you apparently someone had called up it was tnt that were doing the that was the bin truck back then. Yeah, it would have been the local bin people, yeah. Yeah, which is a great company. Um, rang TNT to see actually what happened to you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to find it everywhere like, the other night like, and I couldn't find it, but I remember seeing that comment a long time ago. It was quite funny. Now, that's interesting, Matt, because if I'd been killed, here's logic here, if I had been killed, they would have found my body. TNT, yes. TNT would have found my body. So there you are. That's fed completely into <laughs> my theory and several other people's theory that she made a break because otherwise yeah. they would have found human remains and they didn't. It would have been right onto it. <laughs> there you go. And, and it would have caught back to the prison. They would have found out. The fact that they never really found out, there you go. Yeah. That's it. We're onto something. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Breaking news. Um, Ollie just wanted to mention, super awesome. I love Sandy Edwards. Thank you. Thank you, Ollie, very much. I've got one last question. Can you tell the fans the story of you being paged at an airport? Well, apparently you got paged a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do. Um, my name is... Um, is my, it's half, I'm half French. Um, my grandfather was French. His name was Louis Lene, and I'm named, I'm named after him, Louise Lene. So it's quite a simple name, L E N A Y, but those five letters get mixed up so often, I can't begin to tell you. And so all my life, I've, it's been mispronounced. And quite often, it's people get it wrong and they and they page me you know at the bank or in a shop or if I'm waiting for something or, or worse at an airport and you don't recognize it but you hear this voice over the headphone going Miss Leany Lois Leany could you make your way to the to the front desk please paging Lois Leany <laughs> I can ignore that for hours before I realize it actually is me but it happens all the time it's interesting that it goes to Lois Leany Lois Leany <laughs> it's one of those funny I've come to live with it quite like Lois Leany I feel like she's my alter ego sounds like some sort of superhero <laughs> yeah, that's right yeah that is a funny story um, a fan messaged me last night on Facebook actually just to say his name is Jason Yates said also with Sandy Edwards coming to prison it was the beginning of the golden era Wow. Well, there's some great, uh, honestly, in, in Australia, some of the great Australian actors went on to prisoner. I don't know that I was one of them, but there have been a lot. And, and as I say, a girl I went through, one of the girls in my year, Glenda Linscott, was in it um, probably maybe 10 years after me or five years after me um, for quite a long time too. Fabulous actress and really a striking character. Um, yeah, you maybe you might be right. I don't know that I had anything to do with that, but I think there were some great actors that went uh, and did their did their time, did their time on Prisoner, and it's uh, to the to the strength of the show, really. And of course, the you know the standard, the ones that started it, they were there really right to the bitter end, pretty well. And uh, it was just a it was a fabulous. Fabulous all-round standard, fabulous all-round effort, I think. It was really good. I'm grateful as anything. Well, I have to say, <laughs> I'm a fan myself, that you were superb, brilliant, as Sandy Edwards. Matt. And, uh, yeah, it was it was really amazing that you, you know, just for those 29 episodes, had such a huge impact on, on the fans. So on behalf of the fans, well, we do thank you because I wasn't on the show. <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you Matt thank you Ken and thank you to all the cast and crew and writers that uh, and and the people what who watched who made it without them the show would be nothing thank you so much thank you so much for having me
And best wishes to everybody in COVID. Double jab. COVID, yes. Yeah, double jab. That was episode 17 of Talking Prisoner. And thank you for watching. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. And this episode of Talking Prisoner is also available across all the podcast platforms, including Apple, Spotify, iHeart, and the 50 others. And it'll also be on our website, talkingprisoner.com.